Good evening, everyone. We would, the Democratic and Republican Town Committees would like to welcome you to our annual debate. Um, we'd first like to, my name is Jacqueline Ryan. I am the chairwoman of the Southbridge Democratic Town Committee. Um, on behalf of both our committees, I'd like to thank all the candidates for being here tonight. Uh, I know how hard it is to run. I was here just a year ago, so thank you all for putting your name up um, and running. And I'd like to thank the Cable Committee for putting all this together. Um, I know it's a, hard, a lot of hard work, and I appreciate all that you guys do. Um, and I will now hand it over to Tom. Thank you very much. Good evening. I'm uh, Bob Shineski. I'm Secretary of the Selfridge Republican Town Committee. And uh, I want to echo uh, Jackie's uh, welcome and thank you for tuning in. Uh, this should be a uh, an exciting night of uh, local politics. Speaking for the Republican Town Committee, I must say that this is an event that uh, we are proud and happy to co-host in an era of, of political divisiveness. Democrats and Republicans in our town have come together in, in an attitude of, of uh, civility and mutual respect to, um, to give voters an opportunity to see and hear the candidates and, and your ideas. This is a critical time in our town. Southbridge faces many difficult issues. It's our hope that tonight's debate will provide insights that each voter can use to make their decisions. Thanks again for watching. Thank you, Bob. Um, it is now my honor to introduce tonight's moderator. Rich Merrill uh, has a history of moderating our debates. He moderated mine last year. It was quite fun having him there, and he was quite a good moderator, so we both felt, you know, let's bring him back. So, bitch now. Well, thank you. Thank you, Bob, and thank you, Jackie. Yes, we did this last year, and it was a little bit cooler last year. We had a little few more people in the crowd last year because I think everybody out there in Southbridge land knows how hot it can get up here, and it's already started. Thank you, John, for turning on the uh, fan right behind me. I hope you can enjoy some of that coolness from the fan as well. My name's Rich Merrill. I'm just a citizen here in Southbridge, and I've been living here for about 35 years. And during that 35 years, we've seen a lot of changes in this town, some good, some not so good. But we've always had people who are interested in running for council. What if they gave an election and no candidates showed up? We don't have that problem in Southbridge. Some of the neighboring towns do. We don't have that problem in Southbridge. As a matter of fact, we got nearly the whole town running this time around. We've got 10 total candidates that are running for a number of seats on the, council, on the town council. 10 candidates. We're going to be asking them a bunch of questions, and each question will take a little while, and I got some rules, and we'll read the rules a little bit later, and we'll get to those questions as well. And the way I figure it, based on the timing, we'll get you out of here by next Tuesday for sure as this could be a long debate. Somebody said it could be up to three hours, and I hope at home you've got a comfortable seat as you're gonna be watching the candidates tell you a little bit about themselves. This is the best place to find out a little bit more about your candidates. But we have another race here, and it's candidates for school committee. We have two people who are running for candidates uh, on the uh, school committee for two seats. So my guess is, and I'll stick my neck out here, that each one of these candidates are actually going to win. So we're not going to have a debate amongst the two candidates for the two seats, but we are going to have Martina Shea and Bill Bishop, if Bill is, uh, is here. And I don't know if he is. I know he's uh, uh, the principal of Northbridge uh, High School, and they're going to be having a graduation tomorrow, so he, he may not be here. So in lieu of that, I will have Martina Shea come up now as one of the candidates and spend about five minutes telling you a little bit about herself and what she's thinking for the next few years with Southbridge. Good evening. We stand here tonight, 24 hours from now, our high school class will graduate. That's what this whole thing is about. The school committee is about having students come in kindergarten and preschool, be educated, and graduate. 
Tomorrow is their graduation. But we don't call it graduation, we call it commencement because it's a new beginning for them and this is a new beginning for us. We have new people running for school committee, new people running for town council. We have new students who are getting ready to start their lives in preschool and kindergarten, and it's going to be ever forward. I'm happy to be part of this. I know that uh, normally speaking there's questions and I sat today and I tried to think what am I going to say when nobody's asking me any questions. And I looked at the morning paper and I looked at Facebook this morning and things popped off the screen at me. The first one, of course, was this is graduation time. Bill Bishop would be here, but he's getting ready for graduation. Um, the next thing, of course, is the budget, the state budget and the local budget. Uh, we need to give money to the schools on the federal, the state, and the local level. Without money, we cannot educate our children. And if we don't educate our children, then 12 years from now, there will not be a successful commencement for a new class of grads. This year, I think the school committee and the town council uh, failed in one responsibility. I know that we're under state receivership, but it's still our money, and we didn't hold them, the state, the school department, responsible for their budget, and as a result, we're in the hole again. We've been here so many times, they've blamed us, they've said that we haven't done well. Now we're blaming the state, saying they haven't done well, but we need to hold them to the fire this year. We had one member of the town, the school committee have to go and request for freedom of information for the budget for next year. This is not the way it should be. We should have free and open discussions of our budget. I know that it's just the bottom number that we get to say yes or no to, but we need to keep our eye on the budget. Another thing is curriculum. Every single time we get a new principal, and this year we are going to have both a new receiver and a new high school principal, uh, we get a new curriculum. We need someone from the school department who has some experience with curriculum. Fortunately, you will have Mr. Bishop and myself who are both lifetime educators who will be able to guide these people in choosing and following a good curriculum. My passion, of, as I've always said, is books, library books for kids. Right now, our elementary libraries are closed due to budget cuts. With budget cu more budget cuts coming, there will be less libraries. We need, need, need to put books in the hands of kids. For those of you at home, you can get books at our local library, which is wonderful. Many, many children's books are available free online. You can read them online. In fact, I was, uh, spent part of last summer reading all the uh, picture books I had missed. So read them to your kids, read them every day. Uh, another issue is safe schools. Who in the world, when I started school, ever thought that we'd have to lock the door to keep people with guns out of our schools. We need strong leadership in this area. I know I went to the administrative building the other day for a meeting and the doors were locked. They had to buzz you in even after school. I think this is the way of the future, but we need to, to keep our eye on that also. Um, then again, you look around and you're reading the paper and there are issues of uses for our school system. We have a court case now as to whether we should be renting the facility to a church. It the, was very carefully written by the receiver. We are following school policy. 
policy is one of the things that until the receiver has been set by the school department and he is following school procedures. Just thank you. I'm looking forward to spending some quality time with you and with our students. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martina. You, you, you know you're going to win going into this I, I, one, I, I huh? Feel it in my heart. To totally no pressure at all. But now we get to the pressure part of the night here because we have a number of candidates. And I'm looking around the room, and all 10 candidates actually did show up tonight. That's terrific. This is a job interview of sorts. It's nice when you show up for the job interview if you really want the job. You get to work nights, you get to work weekends. You get to be on call 24 hours a day, and guess what? You don't get paid a single dime. Sounds like a job that anybody would want to apply for, and these people are crazy enough to do that. They will be doing that, and, and you do know, by the way, that it doesn't pay, correct? I expect a couple of candidates to get up when you say that, but they know it. It's a lot of commitment, and we thank each one of them for it. Let's introduce the candidates that are here, and then we got a few rules we'll go over as well. And if we could take the camera and go from left to right, I'll introduce the candidates as you see them. For three-year seats, and there's a total of, uh, for the three-year seats, two, excuse me, and I apologize, you should know that, three-year seats, and how many are open? I've, there are three for the three-year seats. You'd think I could have remembered that. Starting left to right, Let's take a look across the day as David Adams for a three-year seat on the town council. Scott Lazo. Next to him is David Smick. An incumbent, Kristen Eau Claire. Michael Marchetti. Then John Daniel. And Joseph Catrona. And I imagine a lot of those people you have recognized before in the past, maybe you don't recognize some, but as we continue on, there are a number of candidates, there's three of them actually, only one of those candidates will win a one-year seat, and they are Esteban, uh, and I apologize, Esteban Carras, and I can't see the tag, Carrasco. Whip me later on about that one, I apologize. John Joven, and Mr. Pulaski. We've got those candidates. We have 10 total candidates here tonight. Now, it's going to be a long debate. We have to kind of follow a few rules that are set up by the committees, and I'll read a little bit of those to you right now. The debate is structured as round robin so that every candidate has a chance to speak on each topic. No back and forth will be allowed because can between the candidates. Each candidate will begin with a two-minute opening statement, after which the rounds of questions will then begin. We hope to do about 10 to 11 rounds tonight, and if not, uh, the, some candidates will be uh, given the initial responders once we start the questions. The questions will be random, and they are within the context of the three-year and the one-year candidates. The questions will simply be rotated left to right across the dais. The first responders of the questions will have two minutes, and all other candidates will have one minute to answer that same question. After our final question, each candidate will be allowed a two-minute closing statement. Our sharp-eyed timekeepers will keep alert the candidates when they are on the clock, turning on the green light when the candidates are speaking. At the yellow right, light, you have 15 seconds. And at the red light, the moderator will end the discussion. Good idea if you would end it first. Let's start right now. We have one word. We do have a number of people here, actually, for the live audience. Uh, applause will be OK at the end of the debate, but not during the debate, if you could please. We certainly ought to express the appreciation of each citizen tonight who comes forward to serve from our town, but we ask that you refrain from that applause until the very end of the debate. And now, let's start with the opening statements. And again, we're going to go left to right, starting with our first candidate for the three-year seat, David Adams. Hello, Southbridge. Uh, my name is David Adams. I grew up in Santa Ana, California. I have been a resident of Southbridge. 
Southbridge for about seven years now. I'm married to my beautiful wife, Natalie, who is a long, uh, was born and raised here in the town of Southbridge. Um, I have two beautiful daughters, and I am the stepfather to three remarkable young men. Uh, my wife and I are property and rental owners here in town. I hold a master's degree in ancient classical history. I teach at Trinity Catholic Academy part-time as a social studies and computer teacher. Um, I spent 26 years in the United States Marine Corps, uh, where I was responsible for thousands of young men and women from all walks of life. I was responsible for multi-million dollar assets and multi-million dollar budgets. I currently serve on the Board of Health, where I was appointed. I, am, uh, I was elected to the Redevelopment Authority a few years back. I am a part of the VFW and the Veterans Council here in town. Um, so, uh, look forward to this race and finishing this race. Um, it's been a long one, but it's been a good one. And I appreciate all the support that I've received from local citizens um, here in town and abroad. Thank you very much. And David, thank you. The next candidate for the three-year seat is Scott Lazo. Good evening. My name is Scott Lazo. I'm a, uh, what I consider a hometown boy, born, raised, and run my businesses in the town of Southbridge. I'm married to my wonderful wife, Lisa. I have five children, four girls and a boy. I uh, raised all the kids in the town of Southbridge, went to Southbridge High School. Four out of five of them went off to college. Education is very important to each and every citizen, and we have to keep an eye on the ball. One of the things that I'd like to tell you about myself is I've garnered a tremendous amount of experience. You, the voters of Southbridge, have elected me numerous times to the school committee, town council. I've been appointed to the building committees. I've served in various capacities. But I think garnering the experience and understanding the budgets, numerous, numerous budgets, you get to know the tax rate, you get to know the people, you get to know your town, and you know what it can afford. I spent 17 years coaching football, Pop Warner football, never had a losing season. Winning is important. I would like to be elected to the town, account, to town council, to the town council, to uh, be part of one of the greatest comebacks ever done in the town of Southridge. This town is going to turn, and there are red hats out that say, let's make Southridge great again. I think what we have to do is bring in the team concept, continue to work together, check out, check the personalities at the door, and work together for the benefit of the people of Southbridge. And we can create the greatest comeback in the history of Southbridge. Thank you very much. And thank you, Scott. Uh, the next candidate uh, for the three-year seat again is David Smick. David? Thank you. Good evening to all. My name is Dave Smick. I own and operate Red Star Oil Company along with my wife, Sandra, my son, Matthew, and daughter, Caitlin. Within the next six years, this town will be facing many difficult challenges. For the purpose of my opening statement, I would like to focus on the anticipated expenses based on studies and reports that were completed on behalf of the town. Let me state some of those areas. Extensive capital needs for the water and sewer systems, road pavement plan, new fire station, school improvements, six-year capital improvement plan. The total estimated cost for the next six years is $107.1 million, or a 17.8 million average per year, and that doesn't include a new fire station and school improvements. I hope we can further discuss these issues in detail during the question and answer portion tonight. What is needed is an experienced and proactive council. It will require all nine councillors to establish and implement a comprehensive study and action plan to solve these important issues. As a town, we can no longer place that tax burden solely upon the backs of the taxpayers of Southbridge. With over 25 years of elected and appointed service to this community, I myself, 
along with the other members of the experience ticket here tonight, offer over 70 years of combined experience and leadership to solve these problems. We ask for your consideration and vote on June 12th. Thank you. And thank you, David. Don't forget, we have a total of seven candidates that are running for the three-year seat. You get to pick three. And the next one who would like your vote is Kristen Eau Claire. She's the incumbent. Kristen? Thank you. Um, and thank you to everybody who's put this together tonight. Um, my name is Kristen Eau Claire, and I am running for re-election for a second term on the Southbridge Town Council. Um, it's been an honor and a pleasure to serve our community for the past three years, and I hope that I've earned your vote to continue the important work we've begun. When I was elected in 2015, I had several goals. Shortly after the elections, I met with our then also brand new town manager, Ron San Angelo, and laid out my list of priorities for my term. I wanted the town to be operating fully independent of what time one-time uncertain revenue sources and to shine a greater focus on medium and long-term goals as outlined by the master plan that was at that time collecting dust on a shelf. We are now looking at regular implementation and updates of the master plan and the town's operating budget is free of those one-time revenue sources. This has put the town in a better fiscal standing and reprioritized our focus on a long-term capital improvement plan. We are reinvesting in our town properties and have a clear focus on repairs and maintenance to curb the costly emergency needs that arise without proper planning. We are currently combining police and fire dispatch to better serve this community and ensure that the brave men and women in our police and fire departments have the resources and support they need. This endeavor is also in part funded by the increased revenue anticipated with increased ambulance service and will have as little impact as possible to the taxpayer. We are also in the process of a complete redesign of the Hook Foster Central Street area, significant upgrades and beautification of the Central Street parking lot and the rail trail, as, long as, upgrade, or as well as upgrading the town hall's heating system from oil to natural gas, to name a few. These projects are all primarily grant funded and the town's contribution to design work and such are minimal to none and are worked into the capital items budget, independent of the operating budget and independent of tax increases. In the past three years, we have seen a new permanent town manager, police chief and DPW director, a new building inspector, economic development director, and town planner, each of whom have brought their experiences to the table, both within and outside of the town. I guess I'm out of time. Two minutes goes pretty fast, doesn't it, Kristen? Certainly does. Thank, Thank you. you. The only woman up on the uh, dais tonight, too, as a matter of fact. We're going to be, but you knew that already, I'm sure. Next candidate for the three-year seat is Michael Marchetti. Michael? <clears throat> Two minutes. Well, thank you very much. And first of all, I'd like to thank everyone for putting this uh, candidate's night together. I sincerely appreciate being invited to participate. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Mike Marchetti, and I'm running for a three-year seat on the town council. Now, I've been a resident of Southbridge for over 33 years. My wife, Maureen, and I, we live at 120 Maria Avenue in Southbridge. Maureen is a lifelong resident of Southbridge and we recently celebrated our 25th wedding anniversary. Uh, my wife is retired from a commerce insurance company, and uh, I'm still working as a rare book filmer at uh, Newsbank Incorporated, which is located at the American Antiquarian Society in Worcester. Now, I've been an active in civic organizations in Southbridge over the years. I served as president of the Southbridge Optimist Club twice. Uh, we organize funding events such as the Booster Club, variety shows. We raised funds to help uh, the residents of Southbridge, scholarships for the students. Uh, I currently serve on the Southbridge Redevelopment Authority. There are several projects that the authority has been spearheading. I, I think they're excellent ideas and, and projects that I fully support, including the Central Street parking project and the Hook Street, Hamilton Street intersection redesign. I, they also, we also voted to support the Riverside Park project by the town manager. I also ser um, serve on the Southbridge Planning and Development Subcommittee. Uh, my campaign this year is about economic development, infrastructure improvements, and public safety. I think the key to the success in Southbridge going forward is economic development. So I don't want to take up too much time tonight. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me, and that concludes my opening remarks. Thank you. Michael, thank you very much. Continuing on with the three-year candidates right now is John Daniel. John? Good evening. My name is John Daniel, and I'm running for a three-year seat on the town council. 
I would like to begin by thanking the Democratic and Republican Town Committees for sponsoring this opportunity for our citizens to get to know the candidates for townwide office. I was born and raised in Southbridge and received a wonderful education in the Southbridge Public Schools. I'm married. I have a Brady Bunch of two sons and two stepdaughters and seven grandchildren. I have over 15 years of leadership experience in the medical and education fields. I see Southbridge's future as being a town where you want to raise your children. We can have good schools and good local business. Why can't we look outside the box and look anew at our business situation? I believe we have the resources within our community to attack our issues head on. Instead of trying to reinvent the wheel and wishing for antique stores to set up shop, let's gather the knowledge of our Economic Development and Planning Board, our zoning officials, the business partnerships, and the Chamber of Central Mass South and ask ourselves, what hasn't worked and why? After we've looked at what's failed, we can then brainstorm new ideas and look at ways to support them. Why can't we have a procedure, for instance, whereby a person can go to one department and find out the process from A to Z to locate and start a business? I have the temperament to be a good and informed counselor. I believe in open, transparent, and honest government. I believe we can bring back the good feelings of being an all-American town. I'm here to tell you who I am, and I ask for your consideration. Thank you. John Daniel, thank you very much. And to finalize the uh, three-year seats, three-year candidates, Joseph Catrona, two-minute introduction. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Joe Catrona. I'm seeking a return to a position I once held with an open mind and knowledge of the town's charter. As a resident of Southbridge and a mechanical engineer, and currently a member of the Council's General Government Subcommittee and past Chairman of Education Human Services Subcommittee. With my experience, we can open communication. Ladies and gentlemen, our town has come to a crossroad, and now you have the power to change the political landscape. As my past experience proves, if you elect me to be on the Town Council, there are several things I will do my best to ensure that your concerns are met across this town. I believe a good counselor is one who always represents the people with an open mind and knowledge of the town's charter, and I stress experience along with working together is imperative to our success. With my past experience, it's incumbent on us to develop a comprehensive plan to work with the school's receivership and exit this year three of the state receivers. We need to lay out an exit plan with concrete benchmarks, accountability, and oversight of dollars spent that moves the district forward and leaves our state to returning the schools back to the town. This will lead to an increase in home purchases, more revenues for the town. This will lead to families and businesses moving back into town. If elected, I promise to give my all to my elected position and make sure your issues and concerns are fully addressed. I request your vote on Tuesday, June 12th, the polls will be opening at 7 a.m., closing at 8 p.m. Thank you. Uh, let me ask you a question. Can everybody back there hear Joseph? Yeah, I, I would say so. He came booming across, and I'll tell you, it sounded, that was excellent. It really was. And we could hear you just fine. We can hear all the candidates pretty well. We've still got some more candidates, believe it or not. Those were the seven candidates for the three-year seat, and you get to choose three. The next one uh, that we have is more candidates three more that are running for a one-year seat. You get to choose one. Your first choice would be Esteban Carrasco. And I apologize for, I, I couldn't read your tag from here. I've got to get new glasses for sure. But I do appreciate you uh, being here, along with all the other nine candidates. 10 out of 10, that's excellent. Esteban. Thank you, Mr. Merrill. No worries about pronouncing the names. I kill names myself. Um, but good evening to all this evening. Um, I would like to thank both town committees that have put this together um, for us to be able to speak and for the public to know the candidates that are before you during this election. Um, but first, I would first like to thank publicly my greatest supporters, my wife and my children. Um, I have a great amount of friends and family that have supported me throughout the years and I just want to say publicly thank you. I've decided to run for re-election for a one-year term that is available. 
For the last five years, I have learned a great deal, met a lot of great people, and above all, I've had the privilege of serving the community that I love. Today, I stand proud of the accomplishments that I have been part of in the last five years, which I have served with dedicated people. I have served as the chairman of the town manager's search committee, chairman of the PPP subcommittee. I have been the vice chairman of the Southbridge Town Council and also the chairman of the town council. I pledged five years ago to be a person that would uphold and bring a new level of accountability, raise the bar of respect, and do everything in my power to bring unity in our community. It has not been an easy task, but I truly believe that I have made strides in each of these categories within the town council and also my community. I have strived to serve my community in excellence and will do so in my final year if I am elected because we need to identify what unites us rather than what divides us. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. Too, and uh, just a side note, of course, that uh, Mr. Carrasco or Councilor Carrasco is the independent. The next choice of the one-year seats would be Jack Joven. John. Thank you, Rich. First off, I'd like to thank the Republican Democratic Town Committees for putting this on tonight. Having served on uh, one of those committees in the past, uh, being on that side, introducing candidates, I thank you for all your hard work because I know it's kind of difficult to put the questions together. I come before you as a candidate for the one-year seat on the Selfridge Town Council. I've served for the last 28 years in a variety of capacities. First, on the public safety field, serving as a EMT and firefighter, as well as a police officer, retiring as a chief of police. I then sought uh, a selection on the Selfridge School Committee, where I had the privilege of serving this town for 12 years, serving seven years as the chairman. While everything along the ride for the school committee was difficult, we strive to complete several tasks and work together. One of the hallmarks that I think as chairman that I really strive to do was to work with the town council. At the time of my election to the school committee, we had a divided town between the town council and the school committee. And we worked hard to bridge that gap and bring important programs to the students in our community. One of the questions that was asked of me by my daughter last night was why? Why dad? Why do you want to do this? Why do you want to put yourself through this? And I look back at all the issues that are confronting our town right now and the biggest issue is the budgets and financing of the town as well as the divisive nature of what's going on. I want to bring my experience both on the public safety field as a department head where I develop budgets along with my experience as a school committee member in working through that budget process and have that team approach that we had uh, back then to bring the town to uh, a level of which we haven't seen in a long time. And I look for your support. Thank you. Why, why, why? I'm sure, the, uh, I'm sure that was asked many times, and I'm sure you ask that yourself sometimes as well, as all the candidates do. Why am I doing this? Uh, we do have a number of questions to be asked, but first, let's finish off the introductions right now with John Pulaski, one year seat. John? Uh, thank you. My name is John Pulaski. I grew up in Southbridge. I attended St. Mary's Grammar School, graduated from Marion Hill Central Catholic High School. I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do, so I uh, was the last year they had the old GI Bill. So I joined the United States Navy, served on the USS Silversides, a fast attack nuclear submarine, and enjoyed the last years of the Cold War. I got to visit the North Pole, got to see the entire planet. It was exciting, I learned a lot. One of the things I learned on the submarine, one of my jobs, on one of my watches, was to take, uh, read the analysis of the air on our sub. And I was surprised to learn when I came back to town. I lived away for 30 years. I installed solar electric systems, mostly at Catholic missionaries uh, uh, facilities all over the world. I got to see a lot of the world. I uh, attended college for 11 years. I attended Harvard. I took a class at the London School of Economics. I didn't do too well there. Went to Yagolian University. 
tied everything up with the Theatine University. But I'm bringing that up. It wasn't the formal education where I learned the most. I learned the most from average working people, some people that never spent the day of their lives in school with creative solutions. I learned that thinking outside the box was a good place to go when there are problems. Like in our town, we have some of the same problems. We've been having them for, for 10 years. I'm not running for school committee, but when I returned 10 years ago, whoops, I'm almost out of time already. I just want to serve for a year. I'm concerned that someone is going to be bringing in dirty soil to uh, the land outside the landfill. They do not need to get the uh, proper permits that we need for the landfill. My time's up, so hopefully I'll be able to get what I want to say in through the rest of the evening. The only candidate who uh, has visited the North Pole, I suspect, anyway, Probably. John, but thank you. Well, it's time for the questions right now, and no one has actually, that's up here, has seen these questions. They were done, put together by the Democratic Committee and the Republican Committee here in Southbridge. I just got the questions just as the debate was to begin, so I haven't even read through all the questions either. So they're hearing the questions for the first time. I'm reading them for the first time. The first one is relatively easy question to answer. And they all won't be so. Uh, and we've got about uh, 10, maybe even 12 questions. Let's see how much time we have. You have two minutes, if you're the first one to answer the question, to answer the question. If you're the second, all the way through, you'll have a minute each. We'll start, same place, with David Adams this time. David, two minutes Thanks, to answer yeah, this no. question. People at home will be able to see the questions. The people up here have to remember. It's a simple question. What is Southridge's greatest strength? It's what people. Is, it's people. It's the fact that you have a history here. Um, I believe that Southbridge has the ability to come back from whatever it is that's ailing it, which I would assume to be um, division. I would assume it to be um, blight. I would assume it to be economic development or the failure of. I would assume it to be um, the roads, um, the education system. So that being said, I believe that the people are the greatest strength uh, for this community. And it's now time we talk about experience. I do have proven experience and I have successful experience. Um, anybody can just have experience. Um, one thing I've noticed when I've walked around here, done my meet and greets, done things online, phone calls, is how much the people care about this community. They, um, they have their own opinion on quite a few things, and one thing that I think I bring to the table on this is to be able to listen to them and understand where they're coming from. No, I wasn't born and I was not raised in the town of Southbridge, but I've been around long enough to see that the people of this town have a strength like no other. I came to this town, I stayed in this town because of the people, because of the small town atmosphere that you and I provide. So all I'm gonna leave you with is the fact that I believe that my experience, my proven experience, my successful experience will benefit the people of this town and bring them a little closer together in the end. Um, so thank you. Could you repeat that question? And thank you very much. And the same question to you, Scott, except half the time you got one minute. Could you repeat the question? What is Southbridge's greatest strength? Southbridge's greatest strength is its people. I've lived here all my life. We've had ups, downs, ins and outs. But the people always come together in tough times. When the tornado hit, I've never seen Southbridge come together to help each other to move forward. But what we're gonna be coming into is a different storm, a financial storm, a disaster is on the horizon. We as a people have to face it, and I, with the experience that I'm providing, budgetarily, long-range planning, team concept, we can pull this together and pull through this financial dilemma that we're gonna have once the landfill is gone, the money is gone. We're almost at maximum tax levy. We're gonna have some issues. It's no time for on-the-job training. Vote the experience ticket. Is there anybody that doesn't remember the tornado and how the town came together? Southbridge's greatest strength, David Smick, one minute. Uh, Southbridge's greatest strength 
is its people and their resilience, and their, which is their ability to bounce back. We have shown that throughout our history. Uh, generally, we're kind of in a low point right now. Uh, it's been mentioned within the last six months about our reputation uh, as a town. And uh, so I think, you know, the people and there is their ability to bounce back. Thank you. And we'll move along right now. Same question, Kristen. Thank you. I will also um, echo that Southbridge's greatest strength is its people. Um, as has been mentioned up here, you see during times of trouble, whether it be the tornado, the fire on Main Street, um, or other uh, massive events, you see the people come out together. Um, you see people who, um, you know, on a regular day probably wouldn't be talking to each other, shaking each other's hands, working together to try and get things done. Um, and that's, that's a beautiful thing to see um, out there on the regular basis in the town of Southbridge. Um, I also think that um, along that same vein, one of our greatest strengths is the diversity in this community. Um, we have, um, you know, generations growing up, and my generation um, was, was one of them with a lot of cultural um, differences and, and a lot of learning that you can do for um, all of these other experiences with, um, you know, children, people, adults who have different backgrounds than us and were raised differently, and it's a learning experience. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. Mike Marchetti. <clears throat> I'm, I'm going to have to agree with everyone else. The Southbridge's greatest strength is its people. You know, last year during the campaign that Casella ran to expand the landfill, I, uh, me and a few other counselors, and, and Kristen Eau Claire especially, we formed a committee to fight Casella's plan to expand the landfill. And we had a lot of residents that came together all of us were from different backgrounds. We all had different, different political philosophies, Democrats, Republicans, liberals, conservatives. Everyone had their own ideas. But we all came together and we all fought for one common goal, and that was to stop the landfill. And we convinced a 60% majority of Southbridge people to vote against the landfill expansion. So the greatest strength in Southbridge, it's the people. Thank you. And that's pretty much a common answer that we might hear. Feel free as we go down the line to bring up the second greatest strength as well, if you want to say the first is the people. John Daniel, it's up to you now. One minute. Well, I'm going to echo everyone else. Southbridge's greatest strength by far is the people. But why is it the people? Because you, the people, are fair-minded. You use your common sense. You have a great amount of diversity and a wide knowledge base which you use to facilitate your common sense. And I know for a fact that you're willing to help if only you're asked, and you're asked by being treated with dignity and respect. I know that you are looking for us to be your leaders. You're wondering which of us can be your leaders. I understand that you don't want arguing up here, but you want facilitating good work, common work, dedicated work based on the common sense that you possess. Thank you. And Joseph Catrono, what is Southbridge's greatest strength? Thank you. I believe the people, again, of Southbridge and the historical value that the town of Southbridge has. Now we need experienced leaders to represent the diverse culture and to move the town forward once again. Thank you. And thank you. Go on to the one-year candidates right now. Esteban Carrasco. Yes, um, I, I have to agree with all other seven candidates that have spoken. I, I do agree that um, our greatest strength is our people. We, we live in a community that is multicultural, multi-ethical. Um, I've had the privilege to work in the trenches with our community. Um, during our town manager search committee um, three years ago, one of our um, committee members, Terry Colignese, she made a statement that I have never forgotten, and it's, she said, one of our greatest strengths also is the bones of our community. We have great history, we have foundation, and we can't oversee also, we have a lot of local businesses that are invested in our community. You've seen that when our community has come together, um, when there was a disaster in Puerto Rico, we formed the committee, Southbridge for Puerto Rico, 
And one of the greatest assets was Big Bunny Market. Um, we see when there was a fire, we were able to clothe families and children when they lost it all. Thank you. Thank you, Esteban. Every candidate has said the people, but they have different reasons and different incidences to bring up why it is the people. So that's interesting, too. Jack Joven, great Thank strength you. of Southbridge. Thank you. Being number nine on the list, of course it is the people. It is the people of our community that make up the very fabric of our, uh, our workforce, our public safety department. We have a tremendous public safety department, a highway department. Uh, we have tremendous services in this town and we take some of those services for granted. I think it's incumbent on us as leaders of the community to take a look at the people and reach out to them because they do have such diverse culture and experience and we need to bring them to the table to say, hey, what is your vision of the town and how we as town councilors can take that information and make that happen. Let's develop the vision of our people and our community and say this is where we are, we don't want to be here, and let's get steps to get to the place that we really want to be. Thank you. And John Pulaski, you have the unprecedented ability here to make this unanimous, the greatest strength of Southbridge, and if you say anything else but people first. I'm going to disappoint you, sir. There you go. Yes, we have great people, but honestly, as I listened, my favorite, if I was to list my favorite 50 people that I've known in my 50 some odd years, I'd have to say 45 of them are in our, our cemeteries right now. We have people brought up, now we've, uh, we've got a great history, but uh, the Southbridge I left, and this is, this is gonna cost me votes, the Southbridge I left in 1977 is not the Southbridge I returned to, in 2007. A lie will get around town before the truth gets its shoes on. We have a candidate up here who is being browbeaten on a disturbing, despicable, underhanded, manipulative, dirty political scheme. I can't put the whole thing together. I don't want to get into conspiracy theories, but anyone that doesn't vote for that candidate, I don't want you to vote for me because of what was said about that candidate. I think we're too polite in this town. I think when people do wrong, we should call them on it. And, and I'm going to have to call have you to as far as time up. is concerned. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of people out there who don't know what you're talking about, but there's a lot of people I don't want to feed do. the lie, but don't believe everything you see online. I think that uh, should be seconded across the board. It's the internet, folks. It doesn't mean it's the truth. And uh, John, I appreciate you bringing that up. But we're going to go to the next question right now. And uh, this is actually on the other side of the spectrum. There's some problems here in Southbridge. Yes, we do have some problems. But question number two deals with that from the candidate's opinions. And we'll start with Scott Laza. You've got two minutes to answer this question. What is the greatest single problem facing the town? Scott? Right, right now, the greatest single problem facing this town, and a lot of people don't believe it, is the financial cloud that's hanging over this town on the long term and on the short term. When we look at the landfill closing, we look at our sewer rates and water rates being hiked. You talk about 11% last year, 6.9 on your taxes. We're almost at the way embarking on the maximum levy. You need different approach. You need different types of plans. You need long-range planning. You've got to get more out of that dollar. Performance evaluations or accountability, oversight, you always hear these flashy words from politicians. Well, from my heart, I've spent some time in government, and the buck stops here at the council. Don't blame the manager. Don't blame a department head, you as counselors should be held accountable for the taxes that have been going on, the problems that we are having. They just didn't arrive. They've been culminating over a few years. And in looking at the, the approach that we have to do, we have to look at it, we have to look at it holistically. We can't sit at a council meeting and argue over personalities because you don't like somebody. Check the personality conflicts at the door. 
We need to tackle this financial dilemma that's coming at us with all the shortfalls that we're going to have. The experience ticket, we have sat down and looked at the dynamics of the finances, and we are in shock at the way that the tax and spend mentality has dominated. And it's time for it to stop, and we need to move together on consolidating our thoughts on conquering that problem. Thank you. Scott Lazo, thank you very much. Same question, one minute to David Smick, the single greatest problem facing Southbridge today. I also think it's finances. Uh, if we look at the next six years, we're looking at appropriating $17.8 million a year. Not Dave Smick's words. It's a copy of the road pavement plan that was prepared for the town of Southbridge. In 2012 is when the plan was written. It was revised in 2017. We're 30 million behind on our road repairs. Over 45 percent of our roads are in poor shape or worse. Six-year capital improvement plan. Get a copy of it. You can get it online. Total it up. These two items, 17.8 million a year in the next six years. We don't even come close in budgeting our capital requirements right now. Thank you. David Smick says finances, landfill closing, Scott Lazo. Now we're going to turn to Kristen Oclair. Greatest single problem facing the town of Southbridge. And thank you. So I'm going to be very um, original and also um, agree that it is, that the, our greatest single problem is taxes. Um, at this point, I guess the good news is that the landfill royalty funds are not incorporated into the operating budget. They have not been for the past um, fiscal year. Um, so we do not have to worry about, um, you know, any additional problems with the actual royalty funds being incorporated into the operating budget. Um, the sewer rates are going up because of one of the biggest problems I feel that we've seen in town is that the lack of, um, the capital, the lack of capital improvement over the last, you know, 10 or 15 years, um, and, you know, things like the sewer plant that are falling apart, that we're trying to now appropriate money to get, um, to get odor studies done, to get, you know, things, uh, a fix in there where you pretty much have an entire facility that's failing, um, and we need to continue to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. Mike Marchetti, same question, one minute. So uh, there's, there's a lot of problems that the town is facing, but I think the greatest problem right now that this town is facing is the schools. Uh, before the schools were put into receivership, I read the state's report on the deficiencies in the school system. The problems listed are too numerous to talk about tonight, but a good summary of that, what the state found, is that there was no effective management of the school system, and it started with the school committee. Now, it didn't happen overnight. It's not going to be solved overnight. But we have a receiver. We have to work with them. And I hope that we can take a cooperative approach in solving the problems with the school. Thank you. And thank you, Mike. John Daniels, the greatest single problem facing Southbridge. I believe the greatest single problem facing Southbridge is the schools. It begins with the schools. If the schools aren't properly rated, if the schools aren't running well, businesses aren't moving into town because the labor isn't going to follow the businesses into town. People are going to move out of town because they don't want to be here because the schools aren't doing well. It's already evidenced by the number of students that we have on school choice and going to the charter school in Stirbridge. Good roads, good sewer system, whatever it is that you need needs to be paid for with taxes. That's paid for by the people that live in town. The less people that live in town, the more each person is going to have to spend, regardless of what your tax rate is. It starts with the schools. Thank you. And Joseph Catrona. Thank you. I believe the schools, finances, political infighting, that's why the voters need to elect experienced people once again, to lead this town forward, to go in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joseph. Esteban Carusco. 
Yes, um, I think I, I'm going to echo one statement that has been said um, on this dais tonight, and it starts with the top. I think our greatest single problem is divided leadership, which has produced a divided community. Because we can talk about finances, we can talk about school issues, but if our leaders, the ones that are leading our community, are not examples, are not respectful, don't go and do the work, we will not be able to accomplish much. It is written, a house that is divided cannot stand. And we have Jack Joven. Thank you, Rich. Unfortunately, in this type of debate style, you don't have the time to really dwell in delve into the issues that are being brought up here. We could talk about leadership. We could talk about that school committee report. We could talk about our finances. And all along the way, I would debate Mr. Marchetti on the school leadership at that time and the school committee because I was in the fray. I know what our school system was doing. We had a level one school system in 2012. Level one, the state came in and said, the town, you're not putting in your finances. That wasn't the answer. We're now here how many years later? And they're asking for more money but nothing has changed. Three years of receivership, and we're in worse shape than we were three years ago. It wasn't the town council, it wasn't the school committee. There's a, a problem within education that needs to be addressed. And it's not the town's fault, and it's not our teachers' fault. There's a systemic problem that needs to be addressed, and we as a council need to address that from the top. Thank you. Thank you, Jack, and in fairness to the committees that put together the debate, when you have 10 candidates running for the same seats, it, it would be bedlam. I'd almost want to see it, though. I, I, I kind of would think that the people at home would like to see that, but I think it would be kind of crazy to try Rich, at it this point. Rich, it wasn't a criticism of the committee or, or the substance. Thank you. That's fine, okay. and I appreciate that. And I just wanted to get that out there, because I would love to see everybody debate each other here, and we'd be here till next Tuesday, as I said before. But we'll go on to the next uh, person, and that'd be John. I haven't forgotten you or David as well. John? I think our limitation, our greatest limitation, is our form of government. And uh, I believe the town council form of government. A lot of people claim this town's decline on the uh, AO even. I think it's our form of government. It worked well for the first few years. But look at the surrounding towns. They're not having... Uh, decline. There, some of them, for example, Webster, is uh, rising. It would, we're, our government might work in other community, but I think it's sort of like a set of size 12 shoes on size 9 feet. Uh, look, at, we're talking about the school problem. What did our town council do as our school system was getting better? They decided to have, off the agenda, technically a violation of the law, a vote of no confidence. That's what the council did. They ignored some of their own problems, their real problems, and they went and they uh, decided to pick on an elected school committee. That's the voters' job. And uh, anyway, that's what I have to say about that. And we have one more person who hasn't answered the question yet, and that would be David Adams. Thank you. Well, and I'm going to remind people at home, what is the single greatest problem facing the town? David? Thank you. Um, I went back and forth listening to all the candidates, and I, I would have to come um, with the conclusion of leadership. Because leadership at the top, setting the example, actually moves people in the right direction. So we could talk about economic development. What is economic development? Is it just bringing in an education system? Is it talking about bringing in new jobs? No, it's, it's everything from blight to roads to the education system to following the roadmap that we've spent, our taxpayers have spent a lot of money funding. We have to follow those studies the best we can. We have to stop fighting within each other. We have to set that perfect example for each other. And that economic development will come when you start setting the example. Have a roadmap and then follow that roadmap. Even if you disagree, you have to come together some way to, to meet each other halfway. Thank you. And thank you very much. We have question number three, and we'll put that up on the screen as well, and I'll read it to you. It's come up before already, all about the schools and the relationship with the town council. Let me read the question as it's written here. We all want to return to excellence in our schools. Please characterize the working relationship between the town council, the school committee, and the school department's receiver. How would your presence on the town council contribute to this difficult process? 
and I would imagine contribute in a positive way. <laughs> David Smick, that's yours for two minutes. Thank you. Uh, I <clears throat> cannot comment on the relationship between council and the receiver. Naturally, I'm not a member of council. Uh, I watch the school committee meetings on TV. I try to pay attention to what the receiver is saying. Um, I don't see a lot of communication going back and forth. Subject matter, don't know. I know uh, we've been in receivership for three years, and it doesn't look like we made any advances in those three years. Uh, money, uh, you heard the receiver ask uh, over what he got for his level funded budget. He asked for another $3.1 million. Money is important. I don't think it's going to solve all problems, especially when we're talking about uh, our school system. You can have the greatest leadership in the world, but if you don't have any money and you, can't, you don't have the ability to raise the money, finances are going to be the issue. Um, what the answer is on moving the school system forward, I think it's going to be getting the state out as quickly as possible. Regaining control and hold everybody accountable and get the job done. Thank you, David. What do you think, Kristen? Do you want to hear the question again? I think I'm okay, thank you. Um, so it's, it's as far as the multiple parts of the question, so I believe that the town council and the school committee have a much better relationship than say years past. Um, I will say that I've seen some, um, some really great things from the school committee uh, members, even though they do not hold any, um, you know, technical power. Um, I know that um, committee member Jacqueline Ryan has uh, made some subcommittees and tried to get more information out for the finances. Um, as for the receivership itself, I believe that um, you know over these over these years we haven't seen any real accountability from the state. Um, I don't feel that we have really any trust and especially after the three million dollar shortfall, especially after um, this continued poor fiscal management that we're seeing again and again. Um, I know that I personally don't feel that throwing money at a system that has not been shown to work um, or that is not moving in the right direction is the way to go. Um, so in the future, I'd like to see better leadership from the receiver and that will ultimately be good for the town. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. Mike Marchetti. Well, as we all know, the uh, school receiver has all the power on education issues in Southbridge. Now, I don't have any personal knowledge of the working relationship between the town council and the school committee and the receiver, but I know that the council and the school committee have had problems in the past, but what I would like to see is I would like to see the town council listen to the school committee on education issues, and where there's an agreement, then they should go together to the receiver with their concerns. You know, eventually the receiver is going to be leaving Southbridge. It's going to be up to the school committee. Whatever, whatever changes he makes, whatever management controls he puts into place, it's going to be up to the school committee to maintain those controls. Thank you. John Daniel, same question if you want. I can read it again for you. No, that's all right. Um, I believe that the relationship between uh, the manager of the council and the schools needs to be more cooperative. I think you need to look for common goals. Um, I, I believe that there's been some loss of sight regarding um, those goals, that uh, you can't lose sight of providing the best education for our students. I believe that there should be regular meetings between all the interested parties and not just getting stuff helter-skelter, um, hearing things in the paper, and uh, hearing rumor and innuendo. I believe that meetings, regular meetings, should be set up um, to better inform all the interested parties. And I also think that there needs to be some sense of transparency because ultimately the citizens are footing the bill. The citizens are interested in this. The citizens have the vested interest. And I think transparency would go a long way toward getting the support of the citizens. Thank you. 
Joseph Catrona. Thank you. Once again, I can't speak to the relationship between the town council and the school committee. Going back to my opening comments, I believe that we still need to lay out an exit plan. We need to have concrete benchmarks and we need to hold people accountable. For the dollars that we've spent in order to move this town forward and to come out of the receivership. Thank you. And for the one year, Seed Estevan. Yes. Um, I've had the privilege of working closely with the school committee, um, also the receiver. Um, and one of the things that has been difficult is understanding the control that the state has and understanding the decisions that they make without any input from the community or its elected officials. But one of the things that I, I stand firm on is that in order for us to see success, we have to focus on the success. We have to highlight the positive things. We have to highlight the things that are going well within our school district, within our teachers, because we do have educators. We have individuals that are working hard and we have great programs. But when we have an awards night for our graduating class and we have one public official that shows up, there's no investment there. When we have programs and shows and things that are happening with our children, we, the elected officials, need to be there and be the ones first to support and encourage the further development because we have to accept receivership. It's here. And Jack Joven. Thank you. Earlier it was said that we need leadership from the top and a roadmap, and certainly that is true. Working as the chairman of the uh, school committee uh, many years ago, we had that fractured town council school committee relationship. And as a committee and as the leader of, of that school committee, of which I was very proud of, we reached across the aisle to the town council, met regularly with the town council, and established benchmarks as to what we needed for funding. We needed money for computer systems. We went to the town and we said, how can we accomplish this goal? How can we do it? Working with the town manager at the town, we laid out that roadmap and we developed a capital plan over so many years. We need to do the same thing with the receiver. It is our tax dollars. We as the town council need to work with the state to say what are those steps that are going to take us out of receivership, but also they act as the school committee uh, for the town as the receiver. It's incumbent on us to demand answers from that receiver. Thank you. And John, I'm interested to hear what you have to say. Well, I brought it up already. I was very disappointed when the town council had a vote of no confidence in a school committee that was showing what I saw as the first progress in over a half decade. So since the council took extraordinary effort to invite the state in, one of the first things I would do if the people in town gave me the privilege of representing them up here is I would uh, try to build a consensus for the council to have a vote of no confidence in the state receiver. I've seen no progress myself. In fact, I think because they've, the same problems are continuing, they're almost making it look like a helpless situation. I don't think there is. I think we can turn our perceived lemons into lemonade, have a Spanish language magnet school, and attract people in this town to learn the language, the Spanish language, and it would bring students in, and it would give our students an opportunity to learn in their own language, just like people did at Notre Dame and St. Joan of Arc when they had to teach kids in French two generations ago. Let's be creative. Let's think outside the box. We got two more people to answer the same question, and we'll do that with uh, David Adams. Thank you. I will say this, is that the last few months I've noticed that counselors have started to um, work with the receiver. I've uh, seen Ms. Ryan work with the receiver or attempt to work with the receiver. Uh, I'm pretty impressed with the fact that she was able to get a little bit more information has been transparent and that's what we need. I've noticed that counselors, the town manager, have started working with Ms. Ryan um, and are, are concerned about the whole thing. Uh, one thing that bothered me the most was the fact that the state infused $3 million into a system knowing that the town could never afford that the following year. Laying off 30 some odd teachers and staff members and then now they're asking for a little bit more money uh, to cover a little bit more of a debt and uh, the council having to turn that down and losing more jobs. 
So the state needs to be accountable just as well as the town needs to be accountable um, and transparent. So I appreciate Ms. Ryan and the other counselors that are working with the receiver. Thank you. And Scott, you'd be the last one for this question. Uh, one minute, I could spend four hours on this subject. And it all comes down to knowing the history. Everybody takes a piece of the history, plugs it in and said, it's that, it's this, it's that. The state takeover is a disaster. It should have never happened. I was never in favor of it. I was not involved in the school committee that they had no vote confidence. I came in after to try and straighten it out. We won the election. There were going to be sweeping changes, and they took over as the receiver probably three months after. There is no disciplinary standard in our schools. We need quality teachers. Stop the revolving door. Money's not the issue. The town council has given the school district, under whose anger, who's a total incompetent, every dollar that you wanted. So it wasn't a money problem. It was a management problem, and it was the management of the state. So now that we're back, we have a man named Mr. Villar. I'm cautiously optimistic, but I will hold him accountable as a counselor. I will not throw any more money at a problem that has no head on the horse. When, when Scott said he could take up to four hours to answer that question, I, it sounded like a threat to me, and I just was a little bit concerned about that. Hey, we have another question here. This won't take four hours to answer. And it starts with Kristen. Kristen Eau Claire, how would you rate the performance of the town manager? Um, thank you. So um, as I mentioned in my opening statement, um, when I first was elected to the council, um, pretty much immediately um, Ron San Angelo had started as well. Um, I will say that between him and his department heads, um, as far as the direction that um, a majority of us wanted to take the town into as far as following the master plan, coming up with medium and long-term um, goals, um, things of that nature. He has made that end goal a lot um, easier in a lot of ways because he, um, along with all of his department heads and, and all of the department heads in town hall who, um, you know, come to work every day are, are truly in their own respective ways visionaries. Um, and I do truly believe that, um, you know, Mr. San Angelo uh, manages the town um, by majority council rule. Um, he and I have not agreed on, you know, 100% of things, but I feel that when he, um, when he does take a stand on something, when he does move forward with something, there's a legitimate reason behind it. Uh, we all saw how um, hard he and his department heads um, and the council in, in certain ways work to get the Riverside Park to go through. Um, and I think that, you know, that's just a testament to, you know, seeing something in the master plan is reclaiming the river, recognizing that experts on these fields and experts in economic development are stating you need to reclaim the river, you need to, you know, do X, Y, and Z, and he's open to listening to those people, as well as implementing some of those things in very economically feasible ways by um, seeking out grants um, and, and other sources of revenue that don't immediately impact the Southbridge taxpayer while also increasing the quality of life for residents. Thank you. And Mike Marchetti, you have half the time. <clears throat> One minute. Thank you. Uh, I, I support the town manager. I think he's done a pretty good job. Um, when he first came on board, I was a little bit, uh, you know, suspicious. But after you get to know the guy, he's really easy to talk to, uh, very approachable, listens to people. He seems to be under a lot of pressure from the current town council leadership lately. But I think he's done a really good job. I also supported his uh, efforts to develop the Riverside Park project. So I like the town manager. I think, I think he's done a great job. Thank you. And John Daniel, one minute. How do you rate um, the town manager of Southbridge? I rate him very well. Um, I'm not privy to his um, individual personal workings with the individual counselors. However, I did get a chance to meet with him privately um, to discuss the, the town budgets. And he came across as being a very good person to begin with. He came across as being very knowledgeable about the budget. Um, in attending the subcommittee meetings, I was able to discern that he presented good, well-thought-out budgets as uh, presented by the department heads and himself. 
Um, he had the forethought to get us off of the Casella monies. He saw that problem coming down the road and was able to wean us off of Casella money so that they are not impacting us in our budget now except for a very minor extent. I believe he has a sincere interest in Southbridge um, and I think that's evidenced by his uh, subcommittee on the opioid uh, abuse problem in town, which was a wonderful committee that came up with some very solid recommendations. I, uh, I support the town manager. And John Catrona. Thank you, Joe Catrona. Thank you. Jo Joe Catrona. It's, okay. it's getting hot here. Mike. It is. Um, he's always been approachable during and after subcommittee meetings. Um, he offers his knowledge and input. I don't know enough about Ron St. Angelo to evaluate him, um, but I'm willing to work with him. Thanks. And thank you, too. Uh, Esteban? Yes, um, it has been said over and over again that the town manager um, works for the town council. So I think the, the rate of the performance of the town manager is tied in with the rate of the performance of the town council. Because the town council gives the town manager its leadership, it gives its directions, and it tells them where to go and how to go. And again, if we have divided leadership, we're going to have a divided community. And unfortunately, we have seen efforts that this town council and past leaders past history, um, a master plan that number one goal was to revitalize that river. And we've seen products put together, items brought forth. And unfortunately, the, the leadership, all nine counselors were not on the same page. We were not able to meet in the middle and see the success of our community. So I, I, I would say, yes, I have a great relationship with Mr. San Angelo. Uh, I think he does well. He's, he's open, he has an open door policy. He's knowledgeable. Does he make mistakes? Absolutely. Jack Joven, how would you rate the town manager? First up, you know, not being on the town council, it's very difficult to say this is how I would rate the performance of the town manager. I have had the opportunity to work closely with the town manager. At, I currently serve as the chairman of the fire station building committee, so we had to work closely uh, to develop a plan to present to the council uh, for the next steps forward for a feasibility study. Uh, work closely with him, and I'd like to thank the town council at the time. It was unanimous to give us the funding to do that. I think overall, um, the relationship between the town manager and the uh, council is somewhat divisive at this time, moment. But we have to remember that uh, leadership does start at the top. We have to work with the town manager. Town managers are hard to find, so it's incumbent on the next council to work closely with him, develop concrete um, goals and objectives and work with the town manager to make those uh, a reality. Thank you. And John Pulaski, rating the town manager of Southbridge. Well, much like what Mr. Joanne said, it's not my place to rate him. But I had an opportunity to talk with him before he was our manager when he was walking around town checking things out. And I was concerned. I, I didn't like some of the things he said. But I don't ever remember disagreeing with someone as often as I have disagreed with him, yet continue to admire them and respect them. Why do I respect them? He's the most honest town manager I've ever had the uh, privilege to deal with. He's never pulled my leg about, told me what I wanted to hear. He's been willing to tell me things I didn't want to hear. And uh, I think we're very fortunate. Some people think he could have gotten litigious with us. He was treated very disrespectfully at one meeting but he must love this town as much as some of us because he stayed here and he continues to work with people and he continues to uh, tolerate fools uh, politely. We're gonna go all the way to the other side of the room right now to David Adams. Thank you, um, I support the town manager. Uh, though we don't agree all the time, he doesn't hold a grudge, nor do I. Um, it's just our mindset and um, he, he took a project from the Redevelopment Authority that's been sitting um, downstairs for quite some time, I would say over a decade, and he actually infused some money into starting. That's the Central Street Parking project, all right? And that has helped us out tremendously. It put the Redevelopment Authority back on the map a little bit. Um, he was instrumental in the riverfront, which I supported. I wish they would have gone all the way through just to see how that went. Um, especially with the um, Southbridge Mills, um, the 48 apartments that are hopefully being built here in a few years. And I think we could have connected that 
Um, he's been easy to talk to, and um, I just appreciate all of his guidance he's given to me, and, and uh, hopefully in return. Thank you. Mr. Lazo, Scott Lazo. Yes. Um, Ron Sanangelo is a personable guy. You walk up to him, you can't help but like him. And that's a fantastic thing to have as town manager. But the thing is, with the experience that I have dealing with former town managers, Howley, Boyer, Jacobs, and all the way into Florence Chandler, you see different management styles. What I'm looking for is management tools. Do you have the tools in your toolbox to be the town manager for town of Southbridge? I have not engaged Mr. St. Angelo that way. But uh, in looking at some of the meetings, I see a lot of floor battles on the floor when they should be happening at subcommittee. I see division because of the manager and some of these issues. And uh, although I do respect him for having his opinion, I think his job, and we need to further define through the charter what the role of the council is and what the role of the town manager is, then spend some time working with them. Then you can evaluate them. Right now, I don't have that experience outside of watching a few meetings and seems to be unprepared in some of these things. So I'm looking forward to look working with them if elected. And one last person to answer would be David Smith. David. I haven't had the opportunity uh, to work with the town manager uh, where I have seen him as that subcommittee level on some of the subcommittees that I have attended. Uh, he seems to be a good guy, a good man, and he has, I think, a great personality. Uh, other than that, I'm not qualified because I haven't worked with him to evaluate his performance. Thank you. And thank you. We've got another question right now, and we're up to question number five. And this one goes to Mike Marchetti, who will have two minutes to answer this question, and the rest of you are going to have one minute to answer this question. It's like trying to uh, answer with, about the history of the world in two minutes, because this question is a little bit detailed. Listen up. What are your ideas or priorities regarding general, long-term economic development? And what particular things do you think the town needs to do to bring business back here into Southbridge? Good luck. Two well, minutes. Thank you. Uh, the town, first of all, the town has an economic development team. And my opinion, I think they should focus on job creation. Uh, what I would like to see is a monthly report by the Economic Development Director to the Town Council on job growth or loss, uh, and I'd like to see some accountability from the Economic Development Department. Now, all the studies that I've seen on why businesses locate in a community, it's because of two major reasons, proximity to the marketplace and a skilled workforce. Southbridge is in an excellent location. We're close to Boston and Hartford. We're not far from uh, Mass Pike and Route 20 and 84, and that's a good selling point. Now, recently I, I talked to the state's foremost expert on workforce development, a guy by the name of Michael Tomasi, and he said manufacturing jobs are coming back to, South, to Massachusetts in the next 10 years. However, workers are gonna have to be highly skilled, and these are gonna be automated factories. So there was a program in Worcester at Quinsig to provide the training for those type of jobs, and I'd like to see that training be brought here to the AO campus. That's a large, beautiful campus. I feel the state should utilize for what Mr. Tomasi called sector partnerships between government, industry, and schools. The AO campus is large enough, it could be used as a workforce development training center for all of Massachusetts, really. If we had something like that here in Southbridge, I'm willing to bet manufacturing companies would take an interest in Southbridge and surrounding areas. And it's not just for young students either, older, older uh, people that want to upskill or change their career, it works for them too. It also should be something that they should bring to the high school and start the kids in grade school as well, get them interested in math and science, that's where the future jobs lie. Thank you very much. Thank you, and uh, John Daniel, you have one minute. Could I have a question again, please? Sure, I'll read the question to you. Uh, and it's a little bit detailed, listen up. It's, uh, what are your ideas or priorities regarding the general long-term economic development? Now, what particular things do you think the town needs to do to bring business back into Southbridge? Looking in as an outsider, it seems that 
the efforts in town have been rather disjointed. Um, I'd like to reiterate what I mentioned in my opening statement, which is that there needs to be a coordinated process whereby people wanting to start a business or businesses that are already established and want to move into the town can find where to locate, what needs to be done, what inspectional services need to be covered, so that from A to Z, everything is covered, it's made easy for the businesses to come in. Secondly, after the process, that process has been formulated, you need to see what's not worked in the past. Let's not keep reinventing the wheel. Let's start and build a new wheel instead. Thank you. Joseph Petrona. Thank you. Again, going back to my opening statement as well, I think once we get the schools on the right track, we'll attract more business into town, become more business friendly. Home sales will then increase. <clears throat> I'm sorry, excuse me. <coughs> from, the, from home sales, um, I believe then we would attract new people, new residents into town, which would bring more taxes um, into town. Thank you. And thank you, Joe. It's hot up there. It is. Uh, I, I was asked if I wanted some water, and I said, no, just turn the air conditioning on and think we'll work on that, right, Esteban? <laughs> Your question. Yes, um, I, I think economic development is a, is, is a very broad, very intense topic, and to be able to answer in 45 seconds is very difficult. Um, but one of the things that we have to do is, um, first of all, we have to learn how to market our community. We have to be able to use the tools that we have, our infrastructure, our sewer, our water, our, our full services that we have to be able to attract businesses. But also we have to work with those that are here, working with our local community college to train um, and provide um, the opportunity for those skilled workers and those skilled um, companies to come in and say, hey, we have a pool of workers that can come and work for you if you come. Um, so I think our biggest thing that I would like to see um, is a greater marketing plan, and I think we've seen it. Um, we have a uh, Southbridge Business Partnership that is doing a great job. Um, they're doing some incredible ideas to change the face of our community long-term economic development and the particular things you're going to do about it. Jack Joven. Thank you. Well, that is a very broad topic, but again, I think it goes to first leadership. It's the leadership of, okay, we have all these plans and that's what happens too often. We have a master plan, we have this plan, we have a school improvement plan, and nobody really sits down to say, okay, how can we take all these different groups, and all these different plans and ideas and develop it into a vision for our community? So that really was, is what it takes. People do tremendous amount of work and a lot of time to develop a master plan. Then it's up to the leadership of the town to execute on that plan. The Riverside Park seemed like a very good plan. There were a lot of questions, a lot of valid questions as to environmental impact. Let's answer those questions. Uh, but it takes a team approach to all work together and say this is our roadmap and this is where we want to go and uh, let's get it done. First mention of the Riverside Park. We'll see if we've got some more. John Pulaski? Yeah, well, I'm going to ditto that Riverside Park because I happen to know of a small business that would have only hired three people that changed their mind about coming to town when that didn't pass. I believe that $100,000 investment may have done more than investing $100,000 in economic developer, development office of some sort. Private business is started by private individuals, very seldom by government. And uh, we should be friendly to people that want to come and start a business in town. Such things as having that park, improving the school systems would certainly be a great idea. We also have Trinity, which attracts people. We have an airport and we have a water system. That airport could attract drone companies, small jet companies, and new private jets, it's a new niche. And uh, I think we could have a private water company, bottled water company, that uh, could bring jobs into this town, make use of our water resource. Uh, if we use glass, it fits our glass tradition of being a town that makes glass. And uh, I think it would generate at least half as much as the landfill did within five years. John, thank you. David Adams? Thank you. Uh, there was a study done, 2016. We're not really implementing that at all, but taxpayers paid for it. 
Um, we have 20,000 square feet of restaurant space. We have 30,000 square feet for retail space within the town. How do we get the people here? Within a three mile radius of this town, we are losing to the restaurants in Sturbridge, down in Woodstock. We, we are failing in that area. How do we get, go about doing it? And I agree, this time you have to have a counselor that will sit down with the town manager or the council members, sit down with the town manager and the economic development director and figure this thing out and, and utilize that study that was done just two years ago and actually lean forward and be aggressive about it. It is about education. It is about our roads. It's about our infrastructure. We have to address all these things, but we do have a study and it's a shame we're really not using that study. And Scott Lazo. I'm one of the candidates that actually owns two businesses in town. And it's very difficult to do business in Southbridge. I'm not Walmart, I'm family run, small, conservative, and we watch our pennies and we barely make ends meet. Look at our community. 10 years ago, we had the assets. 20 years ago, landfill, water, sewer, roads are in decent shape. Now look at us. We've depleted, deteriorated, but the taxes have marched forward. The fees have been created for, for businesses. We are tax and feed to death. A meal tax was put on our restaurants on top of the state meal tax. They've been a revenue, revenue driven town. We need a manager with a different mentality. We need a council with a different mentality. And I think that's in the experience ticket that when we get in, that we'll turn it upside down and overhaul the economic development department that we spend so much money on that doesn't bring much in. So I think we have to work on that as a team concept. Thank you. And thank you, uh, Scott. David Smick. Um, the word economic development mean, could, has many meanings. Uh, for the sake of government, I like to interpret it as broadening our tax base. Now, if we had, next year, if we had three companies come into town and they each built a $1 million factory, that would be a great success for economic development in Southbridge. The reality is that it's going to generate about $63,000 in revenue in new growth. Now. Uh, when, I, when I was back on council, uh, I was the driving force on creating the Planning and Development Subcommittee, the fifth standing subcommittee of council. I chaired it, met with real estate agents in town, and back in 1985, our problem was identified then, our, syst our school system was not up to par. That was identified back in 1985, and it still exists today. Thank you. And thank you, David. We started with Mike Marchetti with this question. We'll end with Kristen Eau Claire. Your question. Thank you. Um, so it's, it's a little bit of a two-part question. Um, for general long-term um, economic development goals, if you know, we didn't have some in the works, then I guess I wouldn't be doing my job. Um, so right now, our economic development um, office has evolved to the point where somebody who's interested in opening up a business in Southbridge can go in, see the inventory, um, the empty buildings and the available space in town. Um, they have one go-to place um, with a collaboration between different departments to actually come up with checklists and an understanding of what they need to do and which um, permitting and, and other processes that they need to go to in order to um, start their business. Um, our economic development office is, um, it, Rosemary Scribbins is actively networking with the existing businesses in town to see if there's any opportunity for expansion um, and also networking them between each other. So she, you know, is making this effort so that, you know, one person who's getting their goods from one place might be able to actually get their goods from another place in Southbridge, you know, and actually bring that positive change um, in there. And I didn't have time to finish the second part, sorry. Not to get through that whole question, and that is a challenge here. The next one might not be so difficult because it's a pretty straightforward question, and it's going to go to John Daniel. You've got a couple of minutes. Everybody else will have one minute to answer. Question number six. Characterize the working atmosphere on the current council. How might your presence on the council make it different? John? John? 
sitting in the audience for the last few months watching the council meetings, it seems like you have two factions that think a little bit about what the issues are, but also think a little bit about what the other person is saying on the opposite side of the dais, and then trying to come up with a rebuttal to what's being said. When that's going on, you're not thinking about working up compromise, you're not coming to an understanding about what the other person is saying and what their needs are, and looking toward building compromise, looking toward making progress by coming to that compromise. Instead, you're just building a wall, looking to keep it your way, and trying to strike back at what the other person is saying. I like to think that in my experience as an assistant principal for 14 years, that I heard a lot of people being angry with me, and that I learned a long time ago that in order to be functional, that you had to go beyond the anger and the animosity and come to an understanding about what it was that the parents and students really needed, and then begin to facilitate that process of supplying them with what it is that they did need. I think I can bring that to the town council as well. Thank you. Joseph Controda. Thank you. I want to keep in mind to always represent the people, keeping an open mind, keep knowledge of the town charter. My past experience as a town councilor and willingness to work together with people, I think could be the biggest asset that I could bring to council. Thank you. What do you think, Esteban? Can you repeat you were, the question? I just want to make well, sure I cover it Well, you're on the council, all. so this one's right up your alley, actually. What is your, characterize the working atmosphere on the current council. How might your presence on the council make it different? The current atmosphere of the council is a, uh, it's a divided council. It's very div divisive. There is no unity. Um, one of the things that I've strived um, even when I don't agree with an individual or with someone is to respect them. Um, and that is huge with the citizens, with your working fellow counselors. Um, there's got to be unity. One of the things that I saw here is that this community is paying attention. This community does care about issues that came forth. And we saw that with the Riverside Park. We saw that where we had a room full of over 50 to 60 individuals. and. They voiced their opinion, and as elected officials, we failed to represent the people because we did not finish our homework. Um, I, I think I have the characteristics of disagreeing, but being respectful and keeping the community united. Thank you. Jack Joven. It's always difficult when you have a group of individuals serve in a community. I know that all too well as being on the school committee. I worked with seven individuals throughout my tenure on the school committee and we didn't always agree on everything, but we worked to build consensus. And again, when my daughter asked me why I was gonna run, this was the number one reason, was as an elected official, as a town council, I will represent you, the voter, the citizen of the town of Southbridge. I commit to staying at a meeting and not getting up and walking out. Regardless of the fact of whether you like the individual that's speaking or not, you do not gather your belongings and walk out. That's disrespectful to me, the voter, because you represent me. You should stay at the dais, whether you like what's being said or not. So I think my leadership on uh, school committee, I will bring that same sense of leadership to work to build consensus and build a, an approach that we will all work together to represent you, uh, the people of Southbridge. John Pulaski, the current council, how do you characterize that? Well, I'm going to say something, but I don't want to sound like I'm disagreeing with Mr. Jovan, because I respect Mr. Jovan, and one of the nice things about running, no matter who wins, on our, or the three of us, I'm not going to be that, that disappointed, because I respect both of these men. But I think 180 degrees out of phase with Mr. Jovan on councilors walking out. I think if something's going on, it's outrageous. Just as we tell the children to take a time out, I, I think if things are really out of hand, that maybe it is a time for maybe everyone to go home and have a meeting another day. Because uh, 
there's some bad things that have happened up here, and it was much worse years ago. I, I think it's the nature of the beast. We have a town with roughly 7,000 registered voters. I don't like this one man, I like one man, one vote. I don't like 7,000 people, seven votes, or eight votes, or nine votes, however many councillors are showing up. If we can't have a town council, a town, old town meetings, let's do something so the people in town feel comfortable about going up there and saying how they feel, because that's where we're going to get the good ideas. David Adams, you have the same question 60 about... 60 seconds, huh? Okay. You have 60 seconds, one minute. A bit toxic, I would say. Um, not getting the business of the town done. Got too many gotcha mo moments, no need for that. Um, there's maybe hidden agendas here and there that I've seen since I've been, um, been attending the meetings and listening to pretty much all the counselors. So in my view, Dave Adams does not walk out of um, a, a council meeting or any other meeting because I'm upset. Now I've seen it all over the place within the subcommittee meetings and the town meetings itself. Um, it's not a jab at anybody because I don't know what they were going through. So I am not the one to judge. I'm just telling you Dave Adams won't do that. About me, I'll have the facts. I'll come prepared. Um, Got to make some hard decisions. My experience, my proven and successful experience knows that you have to listen. You have to be patient. And there's a group policy. So you have to work together somehow. You're not always going to win. You're not always going to get your way. But you have to understand that and hold no grudges when the day is done. Thank you. I do not belong to any factions. I get along with all nine councils that hold office, including the one that resigned. I get along with all the people sitting up here. We don't have any bad people sitting up here. We have people with different sets of eyes, different minds. And that's why it's so great to belong to this council in Southbridge at some point. Decorum. You're given a charter when you're elected, a parliamentary book. Whether you like it or not, or whether you like the ruling, there are ways to work within the bounds of the government. And my experience is bringing people together with parliamentary procedure, knowing that book, you can operate, especially with the people that stay at the meeting. The ones that leave should just quit council, stop the crybaby attitude, you're not here to work for the people. Representative form of government, you have to sit here to represent. If you leave, your people lost their voice. So the decorum and knowing your role as a counselor is the most important thing. When you take the oath of office, know your role. Thank you. And David Smith. Uh, with my wide range of knowledge and experience working in government and owning my own business, uh, I think I'd bring a lot to the table. Uh, I have a willingness to sit down with anybody to solve any issues facing the town, and I don't put any time limits on that discussion. If it's going to take weeks, then that's what I'm willing to do. Also, I like to bring a good sense of humor to the board, or any board, and uh, I think that goes a long way. And I will promise I'll never walk out of a meeting. Never have, never will. Thank you. I was hoping you were going to bring a joke to the uh, joke to the council here, here as well. When you said you had a good sense of humor, I thought, well, tell us a joke, you know. But can you see me behind this microphone? <laughs> <laughs> All right, we've got. Uh, let me let me rephrase, uh, actually repeat the question because you're an incumbent as well, and obviously you know something about this. And uh, what is or characterize the working atmosphere in the current council? How might your presence make the council a little bit different? So the, um, the working atmosphere on the current council um, is extremely divisive. Um, I think that almost every person on the council um, would agree that it needs to get better and it needs to change. Um, for those up here who have talked about never um, walking out of a meeting, because they disagreed. Um, you know, I think the elephant in the room is that I once walked out of a meeting. Um, however, it was not because I disagreed. It was not because um, I didn't like what was being said. It was because without due cause, I was censured. And when I tried to appeal the decision of the chair, 
I was ignored. And so without a voice, due to that, I felt that there was no need for me to continue being at that meeting. Thank you. And that's it. Thank you, Kristen. Mike Marchetti. Well, uh, there seems to be a little discord among the uh, counselors this past year, and uh, it just doesn't seem like there's much respect for opposing opinions on the, on the town council. You know, the town council is elected to be do the business of the town. Now, I can work with anyone. I have a different opinion uh, from a lot of people up here, but I don't have a problem sitting down and talking these things out. Uh, you can, you can disagree with people and still keep it civil. And, and I think that it's a good idea to, to talk things out and keep it a, a civil disagreement if you have. I also think a little new blood on the council with a fresh perspective, perspective on the issues would be a good thing at this time. So thank you. And thank you. We are moving along to the next question, which is a rather broad-based question again. And Joseph Catrona, this will be your question for a couple of minutes. Question number seven, what is your fiscal approach? Speak to us about your ideas regarding the town budget. Wide open question there. Thank you. I believe we have a town manager. We have town accountants, people, um, we have staff that are in the finance department. Um, we have to trust in their opinions when they come to council. We have to listen. Um, we have to, um, as counselors, make the right decisions. As we know, we're facing um, the possibility of increased taxes. So I go back to the staff that we have um, to lead us in the right direction and for us to make the right decisions. Thank you. Esteban. Yes, um, I, I think my fiscal approach is cautious because we have to understand our community, understand our tax base, understand our citizens. We cannot continue to just raise taxes and expect our citizens to just carry the load. I think we need to understand and do better planning. I think um, I, I would agree with uh, Mr. Catrona that we have to trust the experts. We have to trust our department heads. But at the same time, some of our purchases, some of our things, our wants, have to be cautiously vetted out. And we have to make sure that we might need it now, but can we go without for a couple days? or a couple years because the, ba the, the burden of our taxes, our community, is important. Your fiscal approach. My approach is a conservative approach. Um, having developed a department budget on a level of an employee, uh, as well as then vetting those uh, budgets through the budget process as a school committee member, it really is a balancing act, and you really need to have a council that's going to take a look at all the needs of the community, and we have a tremendous amount of needs. The school needs money, our public safety departments need money, we need to fix ro roads, but we also have to remind ourselves that we have a tax base and we have a taxpayer that cannot afford uh, the ever-increasing burden. So it really is having department heads that can um, present a budget in a responsible manner and be able to defend that budget. Many years ago, um, a, a Dark Logan, who served on this council and was on school committee, uh, questioned the school principal as to how much a fetal pig was in the school budget. Just to say, okay, how much is it? And that's the type of level of approach that we have to take to uh, trust our department heads, but also verify and establish the needs-based budget. Thank you. And John, what's your fiscal approach and what are your ideas regarding the town budget? Well, you, you can't put liberal or conservative on something like a local budget. Maybe you can do it on a federal level, but on a local level, we know some things are getting too much money, some things are getting enough. Sometimes the money is a solution. Sometimes the uh, money isn't a solution. I, I, don't th I think if we doubled the money at the school department, we're not going to have the results that people think. I think creativity is really the thing to look at. 
and to ask more questions. Yeah, we have experts, but when the landfill was voted on 11 years ago, we were assured by the town's financial team that we'd be getting $4 million a year the next year. That didn't happen for a number of years. And we're counting putting garbage in our own landfill as being worth roughly a million dollars. That's our landfill. That's not money. They're picking things up. Yeah, that is money. There's a little fuzzy math that uh, I think needs to be questioned. And, and when you qu ask questions, sometimes you're not treated well. I think people should be able to ask questions freely, as Dr. Logan did. Thank you, John. Thank David you. Adams, fiscal approach. And Thank you. I would say it's conservative in nature. Um, while I was in the Marine Corps, we had a lot of government shutdowns, and we had a lot of no monies uh, provided to us, and we had to do without for quite some time um, back in the 90s and now uh, within this last decade. So I know how to work with a budget, and I know how to make that hard decision. When I sat in some of the subcommittee meetings, there was a lot of talk about cuts. But it didn't seem like there was a lot of cuts. I understand people are hurting within this town. This is a service-based community. This is what we are. We're paying almost $21 on $1,000 um, $1, per for our house. So our, our tax rate is going to continue to go up. Um, I would also have to say that uh, while I was in those subcommittee meetings, it, it looked to me that it was more of a uh, who could help each other out a little bit. So I, I will bring the hard subject, I will bring the hard answers um, to these meetings. And Scott Lazo. I think the planning and development of the budget is important. What I would bring to the table is a tremendous amount of uh, experience in budget planning. One, you have to decipher what's needs and what's nice to have. You have to plan long-term and short-term planning. You also have to detail a budget line by line. And also maybe even entertain a zero-based budget to understand where it starts and where it stops. A fine example this year was the forklift. I heard more about this forklift due to the lack of procedure. And I tell you, there's plenty of blame to go around, I guess. Bottom line comes down to is the buck stops with the council. Hold your manager accountable. If he does not plan, do the work at subcommittee. Don't bring it to the full council for a bloodbath, because that's what ends up happening. Do your planning and development at subcommittee. That's what I would bring. More management of the government so we don't look like the south end of a donkey. Thank you. David Smick, the south end of the donkey. I hadn't heard that, but thank you, Scott. David Smick. Uh, fis fiscal approach, I break it up into two categories, our operating budget and our capital budget. Now, in the past, on councils that I have been on, uh, regarding the operating budget, on good years, you do your little expansions, you, your little grow-outs, the nice-to-haves. But on the flip side of that coin, when money starts getting tight, you have to start eliminating some of those nice-to-haves. And you sit down and you, you look at it, you study it, you talk about it. And if you look the last couple of years, we're raising taxes, see very little cutting going on. We've got to take a good hard look at our budget. And then we can go on for hours about our operating, uh, I'm sorry, our capital budget and how we can seek financing for that. That'll be for another day. Thank you. Thank you. And Kristen Eau Claire? Thank you. Um, as far as the fiscal approach, for the past three years, the only um, real increases that we've seen in the operating budget are contractual, contractual um, salary increases for um, union members and also non-union personnel. Um, we have taken out, um, I believe it was over $50,000 um, this year. Um, from the budget, but when you're talking about going from year to year to year um, with no increases, your cost of living adjustment, even for office supplies and things of that nature, they're increasing about 3% every year, so really a 0% increase on those items represents a 3% de decrease as you go forward in time. Um, what we have done is we've taken all of the um, one-time 
uh, revenue sources out of the operating budget. Um, so there are no more landfill royalty funds. Um, we had a free cash, um, our free cash balance was just getting rolled over from year to year. Um, and as, an, as anybody knows, the value of a dollar today is more than tomorrow or any other day. Um, so we're more appropriately spending that as well. Thank you. Mike Marchetti. <clears throat> well, I've said it before, I'm a fiscal conservative, and I don't like paying taxes any more than the next guy. But I know there are certain services in this town that we have to pay for. Uh, I thought the town manager did a pretty good job on the budget this year. Uh, he kept it pretty tight as far as I can tell. He's very conservative. He uh, only raised it uh, if there was a salary, required salary adjustments. But my only comment about the budget is, and I've said, also said this before, I'd like to see the town budget summarized. Uh, you go to any other town, they have an annual report sitting right there in their town hall, and it tells the people what their money is being spent on. It's a more of a summary. It makes it more transparent to the residents. Uh, those big, thick budget books are not easy for every single, you know, a regular person in town to understand. So I would like to see an annual report. I've said it before, and I'll, I'll say it again. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, John Daniels? You're the final one to answer this question. I'm semi-retired, and if the taxes go up, my rent goes up. I'm not a spendthrift. I think the budget should be set according to clearly delineated priorities, and I think we need to rely on our department heads to present good budgets based upon those priorities. Um, I would take a very conservative approach to spending your money and giving due diligence to all the expenses that are being made. Um, I have to say that I admire the current council. I was fortunate enough to attend many of the council subcommittee meetings where budgets from the various departments were evaluated, and they went through those budgets with a fine-tooth comb. I have to give them all the credit in the world. They were looking at items that were less than $50 and deciding whether or not any of these items should go forward or not. So I have to give them good credit for what they did with the budget that was presented to the town council. Well, Bob, I'm going to look to you and Jackie as well, because I'd like to pull a little audible here for question number eight. Question number eight is a question that I think that we've been answering all night long. The, the, count, the uh, council candidates <laughs> have had a chance with opening statements, and with, they'll have a chance with closing statements to answer this question. I'd like to skip over that, if it's okay with you. The question is that you can work into your closing statements, if it's okay with the chair here. Uh, what makes you uniquely qualified for the town council? You can figure that out and answer that in your closing statement, and if you're okay, we could move to the next question. I got a unanimous on that. Do I need a motion? There you go. We're all set. We're gonna move to question number nine. Keep that in mind, though. When you do your closing statement, what makes you uniquely qualified to be on the town council? Work that into your closing statements, and we'll move to question number nine. Esteban, you'll have a couple of minutes for this question. Question number nine is a controversial one. Town bylaw currently prohibits businesses offering recreational marijuana. What's your stance on this bylaw? Okay. Our town bylaw um, prohibits recreational marijuana, and therefore, I am under the impression that the citizens of Southbridge voted um, for this um, bylaw. They've made um, their request known. I know that there has been, um, there was a, not a, a bylaw, but there was a question, a ballot question in regards to allowing recreational marijuana for businesses, for um, facilities to be able to come to town. And I believe the citizens of Southbridge spoke on that issue. Me personally, I, I am not in favor of recreational marijuana use. I am not in favor of any kind of drug use. Um, I think um, we have to be cautious. Um, we have a community that has um, drug issues. Um, we have um, opiate uh, situations. So I think um, whether you want to use the term recreational or not, um, it is the beginning of something that can turn into something very serious and dangerous. Um, that's just my personal opinion. Um, in regards to the taxes and um, income that it could prosper our town. Um, unfortunately, the town did not give us the opportunity to discuss that. Um, they, they voted um, to bring that to the table. Um, so it is a very difficult topic, um, but 
You asked for my stance in regards to recreational marijuana, and I will not support that kind of use um, because I am against any kind of drug use. Thank you. Jack Joven, what do you feel about this question? It certainly has been a controversial topic, not only here in Southbridge, but throughout the Commonwealth and the nation. Um, my personal belief on recreational marijuana is there's a lot of it out there. I serve as a police officer now. I retired as a police chief. I see the effects of a person using marijuana when they operate a vehicle. And until uh, we can develop what kind of guidelines to keep uh, people that want to use it personally uh, safe on the roads, um, that needs to be developed. The town did speak. They, we have a bylaw that says we're not going to allow it. Uh, if it's up to the town and they want to bring it back up, then it's up to the town. But I, I'm, as a duly elected official, it's my uh, job to enforce the laws of the Commonwealth and the laws of the town, and I would abide by the will of the people. John? Well, my feeling, and it's changed recently, because I've learned that uh, fentanyl which is an opiate, a really nasty concentrated opiate, is showing up in marijuana that people are purchasing. And uh, that's not a good thing at all. And it's not difficult to grow marijuana. So I think if you really want to use recreational marijuana, you ought to just grow it yourself, not go and buy it in a store, and uh, be responsible, like, uh, Jack said, you shouldn't drive. Uh, it's, it's not quite like drinking and driving. Uh, I, marijuana smokers tend to get stuck at like a flashing red light and waiting for it to change colors. But uh, I think grow your own marijuana. Don't be buying it in stores. Uh, medical marijuana is an entirely different thing. Not the, canna not the cannabinoid variety, but the, uh, the THC variety. But there are amazing cancer-fighting uh, characteristics of that plant and that's being developed. But, but grow your own marijuana so you can trust it. Thank you, John. David, so your thoughts? So the town spoke. They voted uh, not to have it, um, so um, we don't have it. Now, that doesn't say if the town brought it back up for a vote that I wouldn't listen to it. I'm not a proponent of uh, recreational uh, marijuana because I've seen what it's done to uh, a lot of my Marines. Um, in the wrong spots, uh, especially with driving, and then obviously their career path. But I am willing to listen to the other side if it were to come back um, to a vote. Um, and my, my, uh, I'm, I'm wide open to it, um, just to listen and, and uh, you know, make a sound decision uh, for the town. All right, thank you. This is a representative form of government. The one thing you cannot do is go against a ballot vote. Whether I agree or not, which I have never smoked marijuana in my life, because I think an Excedrin is probably maximum relief that I get, because I have a lot of headaches. But uh, I have to tell you, it was an ongoing discussion, a healthy debate amongst youngsters. It's like you're going to be legal, legal, legal. Then they came into the dispensary part, where the taxation could have been a lot of revenue for the town. That made my ears perk up. But the thing is, town already voted on it. If they want to revisit it, that's fine. But I have to go with the ballot question. I'm not a marijuana guy, so I don't know what it does. I just know that drugs are not good for you. It's a dirty business. And things don't usually end well. It usually multiplies into other drug use because this isn't quite strong enough. But I'm not an expert in the field, and I have to go with the two registered voters. Thank you. David Smick, there was that vote. What would you have opinion be on this question? I'm on record uh, on my feelings about the marijuana issue. There are many issues within the subject, uh, but I try to approach it realistically, and I try to approach it from a standpoint of economic development for this town. And the only thing I want to point to, and there are a lot of good and bad, you know, there's good and bad in, in, in the debate. But if you just look at what Charlton's going through right now with uh, the deal they're trying to make uh, with a marijuana company, 
The proposal is going to bring $2 million in rate pays to the town of Chowton, plus the property tax that they're going to pay. Now, the owners of, of the proposed uh, farm or whatever, whatever they're going to do, they said at the beginning, any town that voted no on it, we weren't looking at, we weren't talking to. We took ourselves out of the game from an economic development standpoint. Thank you. And Kristen? Thank you. I was, I was going to bring up a lot of what you just said, Mr. Smick, um, especially the amount of revenue that Charlton is going to be seeing. Um, you know, I, I understand that there's a lot of sentiment around that, you know, drugs are bad and that, um, you know, m recreational marijuana is, is a bad thing. Um, I think it's very important that regardless of the vote that happened, regardless of any future votes that may happen, um, recreational marijuana is still legal in Southbridge. Um, all you have to do is drive about 15 minutes, or depending on where you are in town, over to Charlton um, when they open their um, new facility and buy it there and bring it back to Southbridge. Um, personally, I, you know, I believe that there was a lot of confusion surrounding that question. I would like to see an additional, um, this go back out to the ballot with the appropriate number of signatures. Um, I will uh, respect the wishes either way, but I think that at this point, what we're talking about is regulation. We're talking about increasing accessibility to, or increasing accessibility and regulation so that youths in our community are not able to get it in the way that they are now. Thank you. Mike Marchetti. Let me answer well, that question. There's two issues with the marijuana um, issue. First of all, there's medical marijuana, which they're discussing right now. And uh, as I said before, I, it's very personal for me on the mar medical marijuana issue because my mother had cancer, and uh, she went through some really terrible uh, uh, chemotherapy treatments. And the mar from what I understand, medical marijuana, marijuana can help people with, with uh, chemotherapy treatments. And uh, so if I would have, if I'd have known at the time, I would have gotten my mother some marijuana and I would have risked uh, the consequences to get it for her. As far as the uh, recreational marijuana goes, uh, you look at Charlton, uh, they're gonna make a lot of money on the marijuana. I think, I think Southbridge should take another look at it. We could make some money off of this. Charlton's going to have it. I wonder who's going to provide water for these marijuana facilities in Charlton. I, I think it's going to be Southbridge. So either way, we're going to be paying for marijuana. So thank you. And John Daniel? Quite simply, we're elected to follow the will of the people. The people spoke. As a town councilor, I will follow what the people say. It's our job to facilitate the people's wishes and not to stymie them. Thank you. Joseph Catrona, you're the last word on the subject. Thank you. This is a controversial subject. Again, the citizens of Southbridge voted. Um, we need to follow that will of the people. Um, I'm not in favor of recreational marijuana. If it were to come back in front of council again, I think we need to keep an open mind. Thank you. And thank you. Question number 10, we'll put that up on the screen as well, and I'll read it to you here. And this one will be going to Jack Joven. You got two minutes to answer this question. What are your thoughts regarding the future of the fire station? Would you be in favor of putting the question before the voters? Is that a slam dunk for you? <laughs> I didn't plan it that way. You didn't way, plan it that way, right? Skipping the question, it just ended up much. that way. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, quite simply, I'm very much in favor of studying the fire station. <laughs> I currently chair the fire station building committee. Uh, what I saw was many years ago, Chief Lenny Laporte and a group of individuals had put forth a, a plan to uh, rehab or build a new fire station, and that plan was put on the shelves. Yet another plan put on the shelves, put to the back burner, other, uh, other priorities. Uh, and there was definitely a need for somebody to step up to take the leadership of that committee because it just had uh, stood stagnant. So back when uh, Kevin Pecos was the town manager, we approached, a group of us approached him to um, get the committee back up and running and I was elected chairman. I'm a strong supporter of public safety. I've served in the public safety field for over 25 years, serving as a firefighter, an EMT, a police officer. Uh, there's a, a need for a, a 21st century 
fire department. Our firefighters now live in cramped quarters. We have fire trucks that can barely fit in the station. We have uh, living quarters, and uh, that fire department or that fire station only has one shower for all the firefighters. They come in from a fire. Right now, the biggest concern is cancer in the firehouse. Uh, one of the number one topics, firefighters need a space to decontaminate, need spaces for fire gear to be decontaminated. We do know the need is there. We have a feasibility study that is ongoing right now. We hired a very capable firm to conduct that study. Again, I'd like to thank the council because we approached the council and the manager, and uh, they supported us with a, a monies to do that. And I firmly believe that the question has to go through the people. So we will bring it to the people. Uh, it's just a timeline. The town manager wanted to do it in June in this election. I told them that was not feasible. We need to have a comprehensive plan to bring to you the voters. Thank you. John Pulaski, the fire station. Yeah, uh, it's a hard act to follow. The people of our fire department do a lot of things our town, they're not aware, for example, the opiate problem. How many lives the men and women of our fire department have saved these last five years? It is true that fire, the toxins, that they are, uh, exposed to need to be washed off and isolated right away. We have what to me looks like a 19th century fire station. We're in the 21st century. They started, I remember when Chief Gregoire, what was his name, Gregoire, right? Uh, they were talking about a new fire, the need for a new fire station back then when I was in elementary school. Uh, I came up, I went to one of the first meetings, suggested that they may want to consider having maybe two small fire stations, additional ones, to spread them around through town. I, they, they don't like that idea because they don't have enough firemen to keep three going, but I think it should be on the ballot and I think we should support them. David Adams, we'll go back over to you. So what Mr. Jovan said, keep it simple. <laughs> I will say this, I took a tour of the, the firehouse and, and you know it was built in, I believe, in 1899, so it's, it's a few years old. Um, I do believe it needs to go in front of the people because the amount it's going to cost. I know there's six areas that they're looking at for, 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 the, for this new firehouse. Um, I may not agree with one of those areas unless there's another plan for some of the monuments, but I completely understand where they're coming from because of the location. Um, so I am in agreement. I, I, I'm looking forward to the study to come back. I think the firefighters deserve a little bit better than a 19th century home. Um, those guys um, daily are, are risking their lives for us and, and other people in other towns. So I think we, do, we need to give them the best we possibly can. Um, so thank you. And Scott, we're over yes, to you. Um, Mr. Jovan does not need to be taught in this area. He sat on the uh, school building committee. We've renovated our elementary schools. We've renovated our middle high school. We built a brand new police station. They've renovated the town hall, stained glass windows. Over a hundred year old fire department needs some help. Jack Jovan's a good man for the job. He's got the experience. Again, when you have the experience and you've, I've chaired the building committee, $65 million middle high school, on time, under budget, used town owned land, and did not raise your taxes. I didn't do that alone. A unified council, building committee, school committee, and citizenry pushed for this to be done. I agree it should go to the ballot. It should go to the ballot because I'm not sure how the financing is going to work. The experience that I'll bring to the table is the accountability and oversight of the project to make sure that it doesn't end up in a bond company like our elementary schools did. Thank you. David Smick, do you concur? I'm still trying to figure out how Jack Jovan got that question. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about the ability to hit a home run <laughs> on a question. Uh, I think we all realize our fire department is tired. Uh, my, my approach right now is very simple. We gave the fire department building committee $50,000 study the issue, come up with some plans, 
options, recommendations. Uh, I want to let them do their work. Uh, I'm anxious to see what recommendations they're going to have and what they're going to present to council. And absolutely, the people should have the ability to vote on that, on the funding. Thank you. Kristen. Thank you. Um, I think that all of the logistics that have need, <laughs> that have gone forward to this point have already been spoken, obviously, by several people who are very, very well informed on the matter. Um, what I will say is we have made a commitment to um, putting forth plans and putting together the, the fire station building committee um, and and the plans to actually go out and feasibility study to see where it should be um, and how this is going to happen. Um, I don't want to see this as so many other plans in town um, over the years that have been implemented, that have had experts work on it, and then you know sit pretty much untouched. Um, so I'm committed to making this happen and working together with um, the rest of the council and the fire um, building committee to come up with creative and innovative ways to actually fund this to. Um, have as minimal impact to the taxpayer as possible. Thank you. Mike Marchetti, it's all about the fire station. <clears throat> okay, well, the, the uh, fire station clearly needs some uh, remodeling or repairing or, or replace, to be replaced. And we're still waiting for the report from the fire uh, station building committee. I'd like to see what the recommendation is. My own personal feeling is I like where the, where the fire department is right now, but if the people of Southbridge vote that they want it moved, I will support whatever decision that they make. I would like to see it on the ballot. So thank you. John Daniel. My grandfather was the assistant chief at the fire department back in the 50s and 60s. And he used to say that you can't put a square peg in a round hole when it came to moving the equipment in and out of the building to begin with. I support the work of the fire station building committee. I used to visit there as a youngster in the 60s, and I visited there frequent, frequently as a youngster. I've been there again. Nothing has changed in all that time. It's time for a new station. There are over 20 pieces of equipment that are scattered throughout town. They need to be housed in one area to facilitate proper upkeep, maintenance, and security. We're long overdue. It's time for a fire station. Thank you. Joseph Katruna, do you agree with that? Thank you. The town spent roughly $50,000 on a plan to look at the option from the building committee. I think first the council will need to approve that option. Second, we need to place this on the ballot. It's a historical building, it's a landmark. I think we'd like to leave the fire station or build something around where it is now. Thank you. And Esteban, you're the last one here. Yes, um, I think public safety is number one in our community. We have many issues that face our community every single day. And the men and women that work in public safety deserve um, the support of our community. And one of the issues I've had over the years um, is the amount of monies that we've had to spend to retrofit equipment to fit into that building. Um, so I am anxiously waiting um, for this study um, to be able to bring it before the people so we can save some money um, in the long term when we have to purchase equipment. So we're not paying an extra twenty, thirty, fifty thousand dollars for a fire truck because it doesn't fit where it is now. So I'm excited. Um, I'm waiting for that study because cost and location are very important. And thank you. Thank you all for answering the questions. We have one more question. This will be the last question. John, you're going to be answering it, and we'll go right, right around, and that'll call it a day. You'll have closing remarks as well. And in your closing remarks, remember that question, what makes you uniquely qualified to be part of the Southbridge Council? John, I this have, is your question oh. here. It's question number 11. We'll put it up on the screen. Water and sewer rates have escalated significantly over the past several years. This is a question that we asked exactly this way last year and it hasn't changed. Would you advocate bringing these utilities under stronger town management control? Absolutely, and specifically, and this is, uh, this is when people have said this, myself included, they get a very unpleasant reaction from the town, like don't question the professionals sort of attitude. But 
there are towns larger than Southbridge that have their own engineering staff that handle their water department and their sewer department and their waste management. One department, it's done by the town itself. I would add to that, town of Webster does its own roads. They're no more talented in their department than ours is. When we're looking at spending so much on roads, I think our, our town's Department of Public Works ought to take that on too. But yes, I know it's not something we do right away. I know it's something that wouldn't be done in the year or so that I'm going to serve on the council, hopefully. I don't plan on running for re-election if I do get elected. I just want to be on this side of that podium so I can speak more than five minutes at a time and get in those meetings at the end, find out what's really going on, have the rights that people have in other towns and know what's going on in my town government, know what we're paying lawyers, let know who's about to be elected, what law firm's about to be elected. But I am sure there's an engineer or two or a hundred of them in this country capable of coming to this town. I'm not talking about firing anyone that's there now and running our water department and our sewer department. I think we have about a million dollars on each for management fees. I believe that could be cut by more than half. I don't think it's fair. Sometimes those departments in the past, I didn't look at it closely this year, where people are getting taxed through the profits of those departments and people that don't use those utilities are not having to pay as much. So I, I, I think that's another thing that needs to be taken into consideration. Thank, Thank you. you, John. The last question, David Adams, is all about water and sewer utilities, bringing under management control. Well, I think that, um, you know, the, the guys and girls that are doing it over there, working over there, are doing the best they can with what they have. Um, so right now, I'd have to take a real hard look at that if I'm voted in. But I will tell you, I took a tour of the water facility. I took a tour of the uh, wastewater treatment plant. The wastewater treatment plant, that 11% that it went up is paying for that, all those fixes this year. We actually walked over a bridge and there was a sign that said, don't lean on the railing. Of course, what did I do? I had to touch it. Literally, it's falling out of the concrete because the acid, it's, it's sad. Um, so those things that we as residents are paying for now are going to fix some of the problems that they have over the, the sewer plant. Much needed, probably 10 years ago much needed. So um, it was an eye opener for me and um, I, I understand about the taxes going up. Um, it's a tough, tough call on that one right now. Scott, what do you think? I think uh, if elected, we will revisit operating the sewer and water on our own. We used to run the water and sewer when I was a councillor and a landfill. We came up with an idea of creating the Department of Public Utilities, three experts in their respective uh, areas. But I ended up leaving running for higher office. Well, we have to understand, we, when we bought the water company, it was making a million dollar profit a year. We created an enterprise fund to hold the extra monies, to levy the rates, better the water, repair the lines, what has happened with the councilors after we left, they are raiding the enterprise funds to balance the budget. And that's not what should be happening with the water and sewer funds. You pay for water, if you don't have water going to your property, but you have a line, you still pay a fee. It wasn't structured that way originally. It was a user's fee. If you used it, you paid. If you didn't, you didn't pay. But I have to say, this has to get revisited on a big way, and I gotta tell you, our experience ticket, we know about it. We were there and we purchased a water company. David? If you look at our, our six-year capital improvement plan, you're gonna see millions and millions of dollars that are required for the infrastructure in the water and sewer department. We have to address that one way or the other in the future. Now, one thing I would like to say, uh, that 11% increase to the sewer rate was due to the sewer water line being put into commercial drive. That's what jacked that rate up. Council chose not to accept money from Casola. That's fine, I don't have a problem with that. 
That's, that was considered a new road, should have been considered new growth. That's not what the enterprise funds were designed and created for. The town in its operating budget sh should have absorbed that increase. But no, what the town did, they put it strictly to the sewer uh, rate payers. That's why it went up 11%. Thank you. Kristen, it's all about the rates of the town water and town sewer. Thank you. Um, wow, there was, there was a lot here. Um, so when I, when I, this, this question's come up again and again. Um, it came up, I, it might have come up the first year that I ran. I know that it came up last year. Um, I've talked to, um, I've actually talked to Andy Pelletier um, about some of the, the internal workings of this and the reason I was speaking to him about it, um, I believe it, it came right after we voted down the leachit facility with the, the sewer lines going up there and that's where the conversation had started. Um, so he, the, the information that I've been told is that we at one point ran it, but it was more cost effective to lease out the operation of it um, along with, you know, selling of the compost and everything to try and make up some of those additional costs. I think that over the years, the sewer plant has deteriorated to the point where it needs a lot of help and a lot of money, and those are um, things that unfortunately we have to deal with now, which should have been dealt with all along. Mike Marchetti. I support a strong, stronger town control. It seems like uh, ever since we turned over the utilities to private uh, management, our uh, rates have escalated. They tell me that a fence is breaking down. My, my water and sewer rates have gone up 300% in the last 10 years. Where's the money been going for if it hasn't been going to fix the fence? So part of this problem is the, this arrangement is used to raise a hidden tax. The payments come back to the town in so-called enterprise funds. I think the town should manage our own water and sewer utilities and take full responsibility for any rate increases. Thank you. What do you think, John Daniel? Thanks to Councillor Rick Nash, I was able to tour both the sewer treatment plant and the water treatment plant. And I don't see them to be spending money willy-nilly. Uh, there are regulations that require proper treatment, and it's not inexpensive. Further, the facilities must be properly maintained and managed and monitored, and that's not inexpensive either. Staffing is by knowledgeable, well-trained people who do a good job of monitoring what they need to monitor, and also by being aware of what the citizens in town expect from them, especially when it comes to spending the tax dollar. They have built-in efficiencies that reduce costs rather than raise costs, and they don't run a Cadillac operation Thank you. Joseph Catrona. Thank you. I also was fortunate enough to visit the wastewater treatment plant, and I do see the deterioration. I ask myself where the money's been going. I believe we need to manage our own water and sewer plants, and I think we need to bring it back online. Thank you. Esteban. Yes, um, for many years, um, there's, there was the saying, uh, let's just kick the can down the road. And the infrastructure of equipment down at that water and sewer plant treatment plant was not a priority. Prior to my arrival on council, we, that wasn't talked. My first year, we sat down. Um, Heather Blakely brought forth a plan where in tanks were spitting things out that weren't supposed to be spitting out. And that's why we are seeing increases, because we've kicked a can way down the road. And now, yes, taxes are going up, our rates are going up, but we have no choice to fix our infrastructure, to make sure that we are able to pro provide that quality water and provide the, the services that are necessary. So I think it is important to take care of what we own. And Jack Joven. Thank you. So I'm a little confused on the question. First off, it's water sewer rates and town management control. So we've identified this as infrastructure needs. So how do we address those needs? Now the question is, is it should go into town manager control or town management control or stay with the way that it's being run right now? So I guess what we really would have to do is say, if this question keeps coming up, then it's a factor. So let's 
charge the town manager to say, look, this is an issue that we want explored. How can we as a council work with you to explore what the difference would be uh, in rate structure if the town were to assume control of that facility? Or do we leave it where it is? It really is a cost benefit analysis. So that is really the question. We have tremendous resources. What a wonderful source of water that we have. High quality water. Not many towns have this resource. We are very fortunate. We need to manage it well and, and save and protect uh, what we have. But if it's town management control, let's do a study and figure it out. Look at the time. It's about 8 o'clock right now as we do this on Thursday evening. This will be played back over the, over the charter cable. It's going to be put on YouTube. People watch this. A lot of people comment about these debates, and they're not really debates, they're really discussions more than anything else. But people do watch this, and they get a lot of information. I think we got a lot of information tonight from all of these people here, and I think it's going to be a tough decision. You've got seven councillors over here, or seven council candidates over here, and you're going to get to choose three. You have three here for one-year terms, you get to choose one. It's your choice at home, and it's all going to be happening uh, in June, the second Tuesday in June. Make sure everybody gets out there and votes. The man is a genius. I have a note here from Bob Cherninsky and also Jackie Ryan that said the total length of this program should last about 150 minutes. It's 150 minutes right now. He's a genius over there. But we do have closing statements, and I wouldn't forget those. So you're not as much of a genius as I thought you were. <laughs> But we are going to give each candidate a couple of minutes just to close up the statements right now. Take about 20 minutes, but these are important. And remember question eight that we kind of skipped over, and we didn't do that on purpose, but it kind of worked out for everybody, especially Jack Joven. What makes you uniquely qualified for the town council? Listen to their closing statements and see if they answer the question for you to your satisfaction. Your vote may count on that, and let's go. David Adams, you have two minutes for your closing statements. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. First of all, I want to thank everybody for coming today, and thank you for the support I've received these last few months from uh, complete strangers, uh, people who've called me, uh, put things online, uh, had me answer hard questions, which was great. Um, I just want to thank the, the candidates, too, for being very candid and very open just to have regular conversation, conversations, which was really nice. I appreciate the counselors that have uh, talked to me and mentored me just a little bit and gave me their ideas and their either support or not. Um, but I want to thank them, too, for being open. I want to thank the town manager uh, for all the wisdom he has provided to me and uh, information and uh, um, professionalism he's, he's shown to me, department heads as well. Thank them for taking their time out of their busy schedule. So to me, uniquely qualified. I trained and educated thousands of young men and women across this great country of ours. And that's part of leadership, and leadership trickles down. Good leadership trickles down, and so does bad. I think I bring a perspective of good leadership and experience, um, dealing with people from all walks of life, um, different cultures. Um, I do set the example, though I may disagree, uh, with individuals up here, or we may have a heated discussion. It's nothing personal. Never has been. I have nothing to lose at that point in time. It's just a great discussion to have. Um, constant communication, I think, is key uh, when it comes to talking to the townspeople because it's not about me. It's about the town of Southbridge. So uh, if anybody's seen my Facebook page or seen me walking around here in the meet and greets, whatever it may be, been online, um, there's constant communication. I'm going to ask on June 12th that you vote for change. Don't keep voting the same thing in and, and then expecting uh, some type of different result. I appreciate your time. I appreciate everybody up here. Thank you so much. And it is okay to clap after each candidate. <laughs> There's a lot of people here who actually stuck this out for the full two and a half hours that we've been here, and it's warm in here. It's not so bad as it was about an hour ago, but uh, this is cool. We've got a lot of people, a lot of interest in this election, a lot of candidates. Next one up, Scott Lazo. Closing statements, a couple minutes. Scott. I'd like to thank the town of Southbridge for putting up with our signage, our campaigning. Every person in town has been very tolerant, 
But tonight's an important night. You have many different opinions, some the same, different backgrounds. I come from a business background, blue collar, tremendous amount of government experience. Every time I run, it's usually to solve a problem. You'll never build a high school. Of course we will. We did. You can't do this. Of course we can. We did the police station. We need team concept. We need leadership. I have proven leadership as a chairman of the council. I've been chairman of the school committee, chairman of the building committees. And on all fronts, I've never left anything but a better situation when I left office. The only thing I have to say about tonight, we were asked, why are you running for council? Don't, didn't you have enough to last 33 years? <clears throat> My friend to the left, we sat down and said, we have an experienced ticket to offer. We can hit the ground running. We know how to do the budgets. We know how to question the experts that everybody just takes their word on. We have the right to disagree. We don't have to hate anybody. And we know that through the experience of service. I coached Bob Warner for 17 years. Every young boy and girl that played, it was all about being proud. Bring it Southbridge, red and white. I had hats printed. Matter of fact, the gentleman in the front row. Make Southbridge great again. People don't think they can do that. Well, Coach Lazo thinks we can do that. You give me the opportunity with the experience ticket, and I guarantee you, you'll have a satisfied, no tax platform with a conservative approach. Thank you very much. Thank you, Scott. David Smick, you have a couple of minutes. Your closing statements, uniquely qualified. Keep that in the back of your mind. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the two town committees uh, for sponsoring this event, Mr. Merrill for being the moderator, and, and the cable access crew for filming it. And the people in the audience, thank you for attending. And I think we've got, a, we got go, a, 10 good people sitting up here. It's going to be a tough choice. Uh, for the people in this election. Um, now, I want to go back to my opening statement when I looked at from a six-year capital improvement plan. And again, you can go online, download it. The asphalt plan, you know, we're talking a lot of money for our capital needs. It was brought up sewer and water. There's a tremendous amount of need in those two departments. We have to be creative. Now, in knowing that, I'm willing to roll up my sleeve, make the commitment that's required. I will show up at the meetings. I will do my work. I will bring my knowledge and experience to the table. And hopefully, we can find a solution to these issues. We don't have any choice. We have to. Uh, I think, like former Council Alazo said, uh, I think the experience ticket, we have the experience, the knowledge, the know-how, and the guts to get it done. Thank you. Thank you, uh, David Smick. We have now Kristen Eau Claire, the, in, uh, the incumbent for the three-year seat. Thank you. Um, so uh, it's, um, it's been my goal to, to help move this town out of past experience and into a brighter future. For too long, there have been Band-Aid short-term fixes thrown at the town that provide very minimal and fleeting relief. For too long, there have been fiscal mismanagement and poor fiduciary planning and execution. We as a council cannot take away from the short and immediate term or immediate needs of the community, but we also cannot fall back into the same practices of ignoring medium and long-term goals. We still have a lot of work ahead of us, and I hope that if elected, our town will now have a team that is more focused on real impactful change that increases the quality of life for our residents in meaningful ways. I would like the chance to help steer this council back on track to doing what we are all here to do, improve the quality of life for all residents. If re-elected, I hope to continue the work we've begun and face the first fiscal year without an imminent looming financial cliff. 
I am proud of our efforts thus far and feel that through the efforts of all involved, Southbridge is finally healing. Instead of the previous practice of kicking the proverbial can down the road to future councils, we have tackled some of the most difficult and arduous obstacles that have been faced in recent years. The small upticks we've seen in home values are a positive indicator, but to provide Southbridge taxpayers with real equitable value, we must continue this course. Our average tax bill is 36% lower than the state average. This is not cause to celebrate, but rather to question why our single family property values are so depressed and have been for so long, while the surrounding communities have almost fully bounced back from the 2008 recession. The needs of a community with urban problems such as Southbridge do not decrease with property values. Instead, those with properties well above the average suffer from an overinflated tax rate. If we quell the downswing, continue to see this upward trend, and continue to beautify the community, our depressed values will begin to rise, and the tax rate will fall back in line closer to the percentages we see in the surrounding towns. We may be behind the charge, but Southbridge is not a lost cause. And thank you to everyone here tonight and every citizen in town. Vote, Kristen. Thank you, Kristen. And continuing on with the final closing statements, a couple of minutes from Mike Marquette. All right, thank, thank you very much. I'd like to thank all those responsible for putting on this debate, the uh, Democratic Town Committee, the Republican Town Committee. I'd like to thank Cable Access and all those helping to run the debate. I'd also like to thank Mr. Merrill for, for moderating. I don't know if I'm uniquely qualified. I, I would say I'm one of a kind. But uh, my campaign for town council has been, is this year, is economic development, infrastructure improvements, and public safety in, in Southbridge. I, I believe economic development is the key to the future success of this community. I've offered some ideas. I think a workforce development training center at the AO complex is one of the, is a good idea. Uh, we need our businesses to help, new businesses to help our schools, our fire and police departments, and improvement in our infrastructure. I don't want to see more taxes. I would, I would like to see a capital improvement plan to improve our infrastructure. But I'd also like to make sure our residents have a safe and livable community to live, to live in. Uh, I, I've talked to a, a few people in town, and, and they tell me that one of their main concerns is public safety. Some people don't, even, don't feel safe in Southbridge anymore. I don't know what the data is, but I know that you, you read the paper every day and it seems like there's a lot of drugs in town, a lot of crime, and so I think we need to, to talk to the police department. Let's get a handle on this. Let's see what works. Let's see what doesn't work. I want to listen to the police chief and see what he has to say. Some residents tell me they think it's the court system. Well, if that's the case, then let's talk to our state reps and see if we can tighten up stiffer penalties when they go to court instead of just letting them out and coming back here. Uh, finally, I'd like to see the town council work together. Now, I'm a Democrat, but I can work with any Republican, Independent, Green Party, Liberal, Conservative. It doesn't matter to me. I think we can all work together. So I ask for your support. Please vote for me on June 12th. Together, we can make Southbridge a better place to live and prosper. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mark Marchetti, or Mike Marchetti. You'd think by the end, of, by the end of the night, I would get them all right, but I won't. <laughs> John Daniels, I've gotten yours correct all night, and I'm proud of that fact. Thank you. I'm going to give you a couple of minutes as well for your closing statements. I'd like to thank the committees for setting up this debate. I think it's very important for the townspeople to see and hear all of us here tonight. You have ten very good people here and it's important that you hear all of us and figure out the nuance between us. Um, people worry about taxes. I am aware that not only the school, but the town infrastructure is headed to requiring major attention. I promise to give due diligence on cost and necessity of any projects coming before me, as well as looking for all sources of funding so as to make for little to no impact on our citizens. As a reminder, we had over 350 students leave Southbridge to go to charter schools and out-of-town districts to the tune of about $2.4 million. That is not a one-time cost, but continues year after year and only increases as more students leave town. Whether or not you have children in the school system, these are not school dollars. They are tax dollars going out of town to other towns and to other districts. If you do not pay attention to the schools, these numbers will only increase. 
If those numbers are increasing, then your tax dollars are going up too, while your property values are going down. We must give due diligence to our schools. Having many years of political experience has not proven beneficial to our town, as evidenced by the fact that our problems have been in place for many years. Our schools are struggling, and our community struggles financially. I bring a new vision, new perspective, and a clean slate. I am a fresh face. I have leadership experience, and I have no preconceived notions or agenda. As a former educator, I understand the need for hard work and doing your homework. As a town councilor, I will understand my responsibility to do my homework before coming to a meeting so I can make the best decisions for all our citizens. I believe in the common man and common sense. They are the secret to bringing economic, educational, and municipal success to Southbridge. Respectfully, I ask for your vote on Tuesday, June 12th. Thank you. John Daniels. Now we move on to the last of the seven candidates for the three-year term. Remember, you get to pick three. Joseph Catrona. Closing statements, Joe. Thank you. Thanks to everyone tonight for putting this together. I'm running for town council because I love where we live and want to maintain the uniqueness that makes us Southbridge. My experience of resolving issues within the context of the bigger picture brings a fresh voice and different perspective in creating solutions. If elected, I want to hear from you. I am experienced in the political arena and to leadership roles. I listen with an open mind and analyze facts before reaching a decision. I'm a quick study and fully committed to the best outcome. With your support, I will implement fiscal responsibility and policies that will continue to enhance our Southbridge experience. I would truly appreciate your vote on Tuesday, June 12th, and thank you in advance for the privilege of representing you. Joseph Petrona. <laughs> and now we'll move on to the closing statements for the final three candidates. These three candidates, you can choose one, are running for the one-year unfulfilled term. We'll start with Esteban Carrasco. Yes, I just want to say thank you once again for those that have been responsible for putting this event on and allowing us to the opportunity to speak on some of the issues that pertain to our community that we all love. Tonight, as the night comes to a close, I am truly grateful for being able to serve my community with honor and integrity. You have heard from this year's candidates, some with some past history, some with fresh ideas, but all of us with the intentions to serve our community. I truly believe that on June 12th, our citizens will have the opportunity to elect its new elected body, but I also believe it will set the direction of our community. As I said it before, I said it before, a house that is divided cannot stand. As a long, lifelong resident, born and raised here, I've always felt the need to serve and give back to the town that I love. Today, our town is faced with difficult decisions, how to keep services we have, build the services we need, position ourselves for the future. But our community has come, but our, excuse me, but our community has some lengthy history with instability and even with those that have been elected. I feel it is important that I can provide a level of professionalism respect, and willing to move and serve our community to make sure that our government's stable and understand that our government was created for the people and not for political agendas. Therefore, I leave you with the words of Winston Churchill, those that fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. I look forward to receiving your support and vote on June 12th. God bless you all. And now we'll move on to Jack Joven. Thank you. First, I'd like to thank the Democratic Republican Town Committees for their putting on this event. Rich, for moderating a fine evening. I'd be remiss if I didn't thank my family, my wife, Sherry, my three children, Krista, John, and Aaron, because without their support the last 25 years, I wouldn't be in the position to serve this wonderful com community that I grew up in. 
We chose to raise our children in this community. They went to the Selfridge Public Schools. They've graduated from the school. They're very successful. My oldest is an employee at the Harrington Hospital, one of the resources that we have in this community. She sees every day the tremendous impact that opiates have had on our community, and we need to work together to address that situation. My son John serves in the United States military as a first lieutenant, and my daughter is going off to physical therapy school in the fall. We have instilled in our children the sense of community, the sense of public service, something that I learned from my father many years ago when he served on this very council. When he served on this council, it was a divided council at that time. Everything was an eight to five vote. They did have their disagreements. There were often times that I would listen on the radio, we don't have the media that we had then, but on the radio we would hear the discourse and the names that were called against counselors. That's not the way we run government. Our job as elected leaders is to provide guidance, leadership to our community. We are elected to represent you, the people. In the words of Edgar McCann, my constituents asked me, he would come to this dais all the time saying, my constituents, you are the taxpayers. You need a stable government. You need a government that will work for you. I bring the characteristics of working in past uh, public bodies and current public bodies that we can agree to disagree, but we must always respect one another's opinion. I ask for your support and your vote on Tuesday, June 12th. Thank you very much. And we'll finish up tonight's uh, proceedings with a final comment, closing comment from John Pulaski. John? I'm not gonna try to pull the wool over anyone's eyes by claiming to be uniquely qualified. The two men to my immediate right are both very qualified to serve on this council, as is most of the people at this dais. I, uh, I probably should have mentioned this in the opening statement, but when I served on the uh, Board of Trustees at Quinsigamond Community College for a few years and on the Cape Cod Regional Transit Authority, I spent a lot of time talking to people in Boston. And I learned we didn't even have home rule back then, way back then. But the people in Boston do listen to what people back in the hometowns have to say. Uh, that's why we, our town government is, our town schools are currently being run by the state. Uh, I would love to be able to continue to talk to my friends in Boston as a town councilor. And some of the things I would advocate would be to give us back our school system. And uh, a lot of people don't realize, you know, we talk about all the money we made at the landfill and the like. If that federal lawsuit succeeds, and another one that might be pending, we might actually lose money on that landfill deal. And I don't want this town to get stuck with that. We only put 4% of the garbage in that plant, up in that landfill, and I don't think we should pay more than 4% of the damages. And I want to stop putting that idea in the ears of the people on Beacon Hill before we might even lose that lawsuit. I also would like to uh, try to get some of my own educational uh, colleagues. We have a great civil engineering program at the University of Massachusetts at Lowell where they know how to clean up toxic messes Toxic messes are very expensive to clean up. But if we have a program in this town, a little satellite campus, to complement Gwyn Sigamond, and get that program in a geographically central place like Southbridge, we have an opportunity to save money in the future. I like the idea of bringing schools to this town. It, it, it's a good business to be in. And my time is up, so uh, thank you uh, for watching, and please vote on the 12th. And if you can't vote on the 12th, Go to Maddie's office and get an absentee ballot. John Pulaski, closing statements. Uh, that was fun, wasn't it? We should do this every week, actually, and we could do this next week and have all the councilors back and have that Donnybrook we talked about a little bit earlier where everybody's uh, freelancing, actually, debate. That'd be kind of fun to see. I don't know you can do it with 10 candidates, but I think this worked out pretty well. All things considered, when you have 10 candidates up there and you have to ask these questions, I think they did a fine job. Very few notes up there, too. 
a lot of people just speaking extemporaneously off their heads, and I'm trying to do the same thing here. Thank you very much to the two people that helped put this together, or their committees did, Bob Cherninsky and, of course, Jackie Ryan. Did an excellent job. This was a nice night. I hope you learned something. If you want to get more information, there's a website out there, and you can find it on Facebook, the the thecitizenchronicle.com. The thecitizenchronicle.com, just a few days ago, interviewed every one of these candidates. Every one of these candidates showed up and sat down with the reporter from the thecitizenchronicle.com. Find it on Facebook. What questions we didn't ask tonight, some of them were asked by the Citizen Chronicle. Excellent, excellent material and an interesting reading as well. Thank you again to the committees that put this together and have a good night. Wow, that was, that was always, fun. it's always fun to watch these debates. I, I love uh, watching debates. I think you get to know not just, you know, candidates' stances, but their, their talking styles, their governing styles, and you just get to learn so much. I want to thank, again, the KOL department for running um, such a great, you know, show. It was, this was, yeah, please. Give me a They did a great job, um, and again, thanks to all the candidates running. Like, I, I understand it's hard to put your name on a ballot and not only have to talk about yourself and talk about what you believe and what you're fighting for, but uh, just to face all the scrutiny you face running off for office. It's, it's not easy, so uh, thank you for all of you for running. You've made Southbridge better by all of you running, so please give them another round of applause for the candidates. So, um, remember, the election is June 12th. Go out and vote, make your voices heard, you know. This is going to be an important election. So, uh, with that, I'm proud to hand it back over to Bob. Thank you. <laughs> well, it's been a lot of thank yous, and you know what? You, you're taking and running for jobs that are often thankless and uh, pretty tough to do. You do a lot of homework, a lot of work, and uh, I thank you as well. And I got to tell you, I'm impressed with you guys. Wow. Very nice. And, uh, well, let, let the voters decide. Thank you. And thank you for watching uh, the, the, uh, the 2018 town election debate. <laughs>